as we as we see, Sauron should do what he's supposed to do here. Let's go back to the Armenia Eagles matchup with the Vogel Stormbringers because it's uh, it's about to get rainy for Volga. All right. <laughs> Okay. First, first bad pun of the day, Stormbringer. Oh, so, I was waiting for it. Zav Zavin Andriasin's game. Zavin Andriasin's game versus Mikhail Gorazanin. Whoa, uh, the king is on E2. What is yeah, going but, on? Yeah, but the, but the queen is being lost, so... continues here it's uh day two the second set of matches getting set to start here on chess.com alongside me woman's video master alexandra botez we are here to cover the pro chess league eastern division specifically and uh this is this is where the returning champions make their 2019 debut alexandra we can show everybody the uh the mugs that we have here both of you and i sporting some coffee here American Eagles is the best from last year. I think and it, it is mandatory it, to have a cup from the previous winners. That doesn't mean we're biased at all. It's just really nice to have a cup of coffee. That's all it means, and, and there you go. But in uh, all, all jokes aside, the Armenia Eagles, the returning champions, are making their debut. We're going to run yeah. through what else we expect to see today here in the Eastern Division as well as provide a very quick recap of the results from Tuesday's matches in this few minutes of pregame that we have. Before we do that, though, I want to preview what's coming up after Alexandra and I. We will have Grandmaster Robert Hess with Grandmaster Amon Hamilton. And uh, they'll be covering the Central Division, which is full of stars. Three big names specifically stand out. Young Christoph Duda, Georg Meyer, and Maxime vachet Lagrave. Of course, not to take anything away from Aryan Tari or Jordan Van Forest, but those three guys are some of the uh, the biggest biggest names of the central division so look forward to that but the eastern alexander is what we got here i i don't know who i'm more excited to see play today i'm pretty sure that all of these players are making their debut um i know that at least nihal sarin fedoseev tanya sachdev and dimitri Andraken are playing here today so uh gonna be pretty exciting alexander did you fill out a fantasy chess bracket I didn't fill out a fantasy chess bracket. I didn't want to be too biased, but I'd love to hear you who you picked on your team or who anybody in chat picked. 
Well, yeah, let us know. Use the command fantasy. I'm, I'm not going to say who I picked until I find out whether or not they're doing well or not. That's kind of oh, that's yeah. kind of just how I Th- roll, right? That seems totally fair, right? To- totally, totally fair, fair if you're doing well. Yep. Yeah, totally <laughs> fair. And if you didn't know, we have a weekly fantasy chess competition. That $10,000 prize is up every week. Even if somebody wins it, it'll be there again. So you should be playing fantasy chess here with the Pro Chess League if you're not. We have a uh, slightly new feature that I want to just call attention to as the games are getting underway right now. Uh, we have uh, Eagles and Volga Stormbringers underway, I see. But uh, right above me here, everybody, if you take a look, we have a scrolling scrolling sort of sponsor feature. And, and I want to just highlight that so many of these teams have a lot of support. Uh, the this uh, We call them sponsors. I would say that that support comes in the form of financial aid combined with resources that the teams need in order to do what they need to do, whether that's a location to play at or other types of marketing and support that the teams need. So as uh, as the league rolls on, we have so many people that are providing support to our teams. I want to make sure that if you're out there and you actually uh, are interested in getting involved, of course you can. A call to action if you'd like to support a team that's your favorite, but also just to provide a thank you and maybe consider checking out some of the sponsors that are here providing support to our uh, support to our team. So, all yeah, right. We couldn't have done it without them, so we appreciate that a lot. Absolutely. And Alexandra, now we have some chess, so that's exciting. All right. I'm opening up the games as well. I see that Artak Manukian, the one and only manager of the Armenian Eagles, has already started his games. He overperformed a lot last year, so don't be fooled by his slightly lower rating. Yep. No, and uh, as as uh, we we've said a lot, and Artak Manukian's performance on board four was probably one of the biggest storylines of last year, right? Right. That he that he was able to consistently hold his own, scathing draws here and there, even a victory or two against some of the strongest competition in the league. And uh, as David and I were covering on Tuesday, and I know you and Robert mentioned this as well, that having a having a strong lower board is as important in this format as having a twenty seven fifty plus on board one, right? Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, if, if the if your fourth board is able to pull off a couple of upsets, it's a huge help for your team since you're able to have higher rated on the other three boards. Yep. So we've got we've got these games underway. I'm checking if other games here. Looks like we've got the uh, uh, the second game here between the Armenian Eagles between Sean Sargassian. Uh, that's Beck 04, um, right. I believe, uh, 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 taking on his opponent from the Stormbringers. So also a game that's that's moving on. Very fast here. Um, yeah, but, uh, international master master Sargassian has more time than he started off with, so he clearly knows what opening preparation is going on here. Yeah, and I, I'm uh, excuse me, I'm a little distracted along with you, You're trying to get all these games up, but okay. Uh, I want to remind everybody that on Tuesday we already had two matchups. So for some reason you're just tuning in now and didn't didn't follow the action there. Uh, there you have those those teams that performed very well on Tuesday and are already on the top of their divisions. No surprise, the St. Louis Archbishops uh, right there at the top. But maybe slightly mm-hmm. surprising how well the Montreal Chessballs performed, given that they really struggled in 2018 and right. were, in, were indeed relegated and made their way back. So, but right there, they're tied atop the standings. The Shangdu Pandas, um, no surprise there. They are really a force to be reckoned with. But Alexandra, covering the Pacific Division, what were some of the highlights you had on Tuesday? Uh, if you were reminding everybody of, of what happened there. Well, it was actually surprising to see the Chengdu Pandas win by the highest margin of any other team because they had a very close match with the Minnesota Blizzards. Yep. He played extremely well. And in terms of individual players, we had Christopher Yu from the San Jose Hackers. Um, he he had th- he went 3-0 and in his first game, beating two Grandmasters. Everybody was incredibly impressed to see him play extremely strong. One of the youngest national masters and FMs in the United States. Everybody's excited to see these young talents rising up. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into the chess here. I guess we've got uh, the Pro Chess League Finals hero Zavin Andriasin just getting started here against Vitelli Radchenkov uh, from the Storebringers, and uh, Zavin is. Well, if you if you didn't follow the finals last year live in San Francisco, you don't maybe you don't know of the infamous picture, right, of the the fist right. pumped into the air when he finally clinched it for his team, and one of yeah. the most exciting moments for chess to see that kind of celebration happening instantly at the board. Yeah, and it wasn't even the first game they played. They they kept drawing the bullet game, so it was building up the suspense as much as possible for the audience until he finally clinched it. 
And I think the third game or so, yep. his team was ecstatic. It was amazing to see live. Well, let's dive into some of the analysis here as they play very, very quickly. Uh, Rodchenkov and, and Zavine clearly aware of this opening. If I back up here and show everybody what exactly it was we had here to start. Another Sicilian. We have it on our talk Manukian's board versus Dmitry Andrekin. So slightly different here, though. We have kind of a Rosalima Mos Moscow variation. And uh, this idea where the rook comes to e1 on move five is actually a very common one for those of you who don't know the line where you're actually clearing back this retreating for the bishop to come to f1 and white's doing that because there's really not a point in giving up the bishop pair uh anymore on c6 and so this is all theory but what is a little surprising is how quickly black gives up the bishop pair here these guys clearly know the opening theory probably better than you or i but uh my first uh instinct right now is that zavine knew it a little bit better as he has more time than he started with and uh, White had to pause for a think there before playing this move, Bishop G5. So, um, going to be an right. interesting one. Yeah. So, what would you say Black's strategy is here, given that he's already exchanged his Bishop pair off and he's keeping the board close so far? Yeah, that's a great point because giving up the Bishop pair so early generally means that you're you're trying to avoid situations where the center becomes open. And even though D5 may seem counterintuitive, that that's kind of what Black is doing here because you're trying to invite White to play E5 to give a line like e5, knight d7, and if the bishops got traded on e7, here white has to worry now about the e5 pawn, and even if you could somehow defend it with a move like d4, which you mm -hmm. can't currently, the position's becoming very closed, and it's it's one where black is going to be completely comfortable even lacking both bishops. Right, uh, and now we see that they already traded the bishop pair off, so uh, whatever advantage white may have gotten from getting that early on in the opening is already... Changed. Yeah, I agree, and I think that I think that uh, Zavin is okay. So he's the top board for Armenia, yeah. right? So we know he should be favored in this first matchup against the Fide Master Rodchenkov. But I guess from that perspective, White's also doing okay. I mean, it's an opposite code bishop position, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so this will be interesting to see if Zavin can prove an advantage here when a couple minor pieces have already been traded. Sounds good. Um, maybe we can check out a couple of the other games. It seems like. Uh, the game between Intermaster, International Master Sargassian and Grandmaster Abdus Satarov is also underway. Yep. So let's go back to that game between Beck 04 and Sean Sargassian. Yeah, this is... Okay, now this is going to be an instructive one, especially because I believe that Sargassian is doing quite well here as white already because with this isolated pawn on d5, the uh, the white pieces are seem to be kind of primed to deal with this. The bishop on g2, the knight on c3, the rook is already on d1. And even though black also has pieces on the open file, something tells me that this has become a, a, a good version of, of a Tarash kind of structure here for white. And um, Yeah, I, like I totally the... agree. And normally the side that's playing with the isolated pawn is trying to take advantage of it by having more piece development. But it seems like yep. white's pieces are placed extremely well here. So it doesn't seem he's making the most of that isolated pawn just yet. No, you, you make a great point. And again, the, part of the reason for that is that when you have an isolated pawn, everyone, by definition, you have open files. It's isolated, right? And usually if it's the further extended pawn like it is now, you have access to squares like e4. But one of the things that you commonly want to do against an IQP is something that you see white has already achieved. Put a bishop on a diagonal that not only puts pressure on the pawn, but also prevents your opponent from attacking your king because a feed kettled right. structure is very safe. So... I'm uh, I'm liking Sargisian's position here, and I and I like also how quickly he's been. Look at this maneuver, knight e2, coming into f4, and I think black might have a lot of trouble dealing with d5 very soon. Right, and this is a very typical of middle game strategy. He's trying to figure out where the best position is for his pieces. Yep. So even though he's moving his knight around several times, he found f4 to be the ideal square. He has time to move it there. There's nothing t uh, sharp or tactical going on right now, so it makes sense that he's taking his time to do this. Yeah, on the note of sharp or tactical, I was wondering if there's even this crazy idea of bishop takes e3 for black coming. Okay, it's white to move here, so I don't see any reason why knight f4 is impossible, unless... Mm -hmm. Unless Black is preparing something with d4 and saying he might even take everything twice on e1 and sacrifice the queen. Oh, yeah, a that's a good rooks. point. So maybe, maybe he can't play knight f4 right away. Um, and what's funny Black is... is mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, if, if Black is going to be able to, to play d4, trade off that pawn, and open up his, uh, two, his bishop pair, then he clearly yep. got some exchange for the opening here. 
And, and I like the move Queen F5. What I was going to say is if you can't play Knight F4, if you make some sort of random move just to show it, there mm -hmm. are these crazy ideas that happen specifically in isolated Queen Pawn structures where Black can take on E3, take with the Queen with check, and then play something like Knight G4. And, you know, we start playing Puzzle Rush. Suddenly we've <laughs> got mating net ideas all over the place. And so not, not something that is going to happen here, but... No, no. I feel like th these players would be capable of scoring easily over 45 on Puzzle Rush. I, so. I mean, okay, I don't. I, that that's easily oh. nobody gets over 45 easily. Okay, unless you're Hikaru Nakamura. That's true. When I say uh, easily, I mean after you know, yeah. five hours of five hours of streaming, yeah. nonstop, and saying one more game. That's well, that's we've got we've got a whole lot of other games that have started now too, um, and okay. uh, it'll be. It'll be tough for us to keep up and follow everything. And on that note, let me remind everybody how they can follow the Pro Chess League on social media when the league is not live. And uh, we, have a, we have an active poll going right now as uh, the Eastern Division gets underway. Who was the MVP of our season opener on Tuesday? Uh, so you've got, you can cast your votes for players that compete for all four of these teams respectively. Uh, Ivan Saric getting the nod there for the chess bras as an MVP because he did go 4-0. But I would say that Eric Hansen, who also went 3.5 out of 4, was right there amongst, I would say, an even, even more surprising performance. And again, Eric is obviously very strong. But I think he really clearly had a mission on Tuesday to really help his team bounce back. So, But let's not forget Christopher Yu. I mean, yeah. he overperformed his rating incredibly. Obviously, Ding Loren won all of his games as he was expected to. Right. But... Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep my biases for the young talents a right. little toned down. <laughs> no, but you're right. No, it's 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 true. And obviously, for those of you who have differing opinions, go to Twitter, follow the Pro Chess League account, and cast your vote. So, all right, Queen of Five is played. Black had to play Rook D8. Let's come back to this game here in a minute and see what happens with the dynamic of White trying to gang up on the IQP. That's isolated Queen Pawn for those who speak uh, French. Thank and, you. Uh, <laughs> and all right, so um, let's go back to a game that's moving along very quickly. Uh, Vladimirovich, 90. That's, of course, Dimitri Draken against Artok Manukian. Um, All right. Oh, wow. They have already traded everything off. They're in an endgame position. This is what I like to see this early on. Yeah, and uh, Andraken is probably going to be the one playing for for the win here in right. this opposite code bishop ending. Yeah, but, he has uh, the pressure to to win the game. He's obviously higher rated than Artok. Yep. And if Artok can even get a draw, that's a great score for the Armenian Eagles. Okay. The live position is still on the Sargeesian game, um, but if you're following the analysis board, you can see the Dimitri Andraken game there that, we, uh, that we're that we talking about. So let's let's analyze this Andraken game here. Um, yep. So it seems like, so Black has a pawn majority on the queen side, queen so what side. he's going to try to do there is create an isolated pawn. If or you notice on one, his, right? Uh, yes, <laughs> right, a fast pawn, exactly. Pardon my French, just kidding. No, we're we're still we're still caught in the other game, but it's early. That's why we have coffee. Yeah, exactly, so. exactly. Um, yeah, what do you think of this end game? I mean, okay, when you see opposite code bishops, you start thinking that we're headed toward an easy draw um, right. from the perspective that, just for those who maybe don't understand why that is, typically if a bishop does find a way to blockade on a dark square, it turns this other piece into just sort of a bystander. There's no way to offer a trade. There's no way to force mm -hmm. the action. So. With proper defensive technique, you often anticipate that a, a draw would be likely. But here, um, here it's going to be interesting because I don't think it's, it's that simple for white because black will get a pass pawn. Mm -hmm. And if you spend a lot of energy trying to blockade it, there may be op other opportunities for, for black's rook and bishop to, to go to work, whether it's on the king side or on the open file. So I don't know. Right. Part, part of me, I think with best play, this should be a draw. And... Uh, a starting, a starting very successful result for our talk Manukin. Um, but, uh, but we'll we're, see, we'll we see if Andre sure. can make it tough. Yeah. I was going to see, we should, we're going to be sure that he's going to try to be a little bit tricky. So I'm curious what he's going to do to try and mix it up in the end game. Yeah. And right now our talk's probably calculating, and this is a good lesson for everybody watching is, does he have time to be aggressive with counterplay? Something like Rook D6. And just to show a line, if, if you could get mm -hmm. away with Rook D6 and let's say you could, you could take on f6, right? By yep. clearing up this e5 square, you actually are creating an opportunity for this bishop to come to the to the all-important diagonal and blockade the a1, the ultimate kind of queening, queening, queening square. Tongue twisted. Um, but if you can't get away with that, it's, it's very risky, potentially, to play a move like rook to d6 um, if you can't get back in time. So um, let's... Uh, what was that? Yeah, sorry. Um... Fire alarm? 
Uh, sure, let's go with that. <laughs> as, as long as you can stay put, just tell them, hey, there may be a fire, but we got we got a chess yeah, game we, to cover. We have so. chess to do. We're going to leave yeah, we, after. Yeah, we got chess to do. Yep, exactly, exactly. So he plays bishop c7. That's interesting because how's he going to deal with the threat of b5? It must be – he must have calculated a line like b5, Alexander, and then rook mm -hmm. d5, forking the pawn on b5 and the bishop. Right, but right. I, so it seems like black can't push b5 right away just yet. Well, at first um, I have to calculate. Can I play a4 and just – give up the bishop and play a3 uh pl play a4 right away just sack the bishop i mean okay i obviously on draken will calculate because you know it's his job to do the work not mine but i think exactly. that that's actually okay no but jokes aside this is a critical line b5 rook d5 mm -hmm. a4 takes takes if uh, rook he... takes f5 mm -hmm. a3 and rook takes f6, a2, the bishop is not in time to blockade because when we get a queen, it's back rank checkmate at the end. Right, so he might be forced, instead of taking the bishop, to come bring his rook back on d1 and then a1 to stop the pawn in that variation. Right, or maybe be... after b5, rook d5 isn't even the best move. Yeah, if that's the case, then probably you don't want to play it, which makes me wonder, what's the idea on bishop to c7 if b5 then, if you can't afford rook d5? So, Got it. okay. Oh, nice. Um, Somebody said Artok is on his fantasy team. That's what we like to hear. Let's see how your, how your fantasy player does. I'm sure you're rooting for him to at least get a draw here. Yeah, and good good call to action. I guess we should give a shout-out to everybody in the Twitch chat. We've got our mods, coffee and tea, hard at work, working together. Some people prefer coffee. Some people prefer tea. That's okay. Some people prefer both. Uh, that's right. Some well, people, we like that, to stir up some controversy, so that's I'm okay. pretty sure that's why chai was invented. <laughs> Good one. That. Uh, and this is the idea. Okay, I just wasn't even saying. I was so focused on the A pawn. Bishop C7 had a very obvious plan to oh, play so the just move. trade off the rooks right trade, away. Trade off the rooks. and Right, because with opposite colored bishops, it's much easier to draw. Yeah. So in and this position, it's... Sh should, this should be something that Artok takes. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, so okay, very nice move. Bishop C7, we'll check back in on it. But okay, if this is how the Eagle season is going to go, it's going to be very reminiscent of how the first season went, which is... Artok Manukian playing very well on board four, right, Alexandra? Yep, yep, and, I remember that very well. Right, and then guys like Zavin uh, Andreasian, who's one of the bl best blitz and rapid players in the world, really. I know that for many of you, Zavin Andreasian is not a household name like you would think of Karanakamura. Okay, yet, not yet, but you will after. Not yet, right? But he was no. the hero <laughs> of last year's Pro Chess League finals, and he is a regular on Chess.com as as one of the top rapid and blitz players. So. Um, th this was their recipe last year, everybody. Artok would play well and hold his own against some of the best players on the planet, like Andraken. Um, and yeah. uh, and the top boards would do their thing. So Yeah, I, the, the Armenian Eagles are one of the best examples of a team that figured out how to put out a good roster together, playing to their strengths. Um, obviously, there was, there's been a lot of different st strategies in the seasons with people bringing high board ones 2700 or higher and somebody a little bit lower on the fourth board or stacking right. the players closer together in rating but it, when you're when your fourth player is so strong it definitely makes your job a lot easier let's go back to the game uh with uh zavin uh zavin andreasian here and rodchenkov because this one looks like it might have an exciting finish in just a moment uh white is white has got a potentially very dangerous attack here we've been talking about zavin mm -hmm. being uh, one of the strongest players in the league here. But yeah. right now, he's got a lot to worry about on the light squares. And, and I'm wondering, right. just to show everybody a line that I'm thinking about, if knight takes d7, queen takes, there's threats like rook e8 check. And this this king is about to get checkmated on the light squares. Right. Um, no, This is a great example of what happens when your light squares are too weak and your opponent has both the light squared bishop and the queen. Okay, so he just played queen d3 here. Um, it seems like he's trying to offer the queen yeah. trade. Obviously, if that were to happen, he'd be in a lot less pressure on the king side. So I think white is easily going to not take the queen. Maybe uh, play... It may, may not have a choice, four. though, right? At this point, if the queen moves huh. anywhere, she's going to be overwhelmed having to guard both the rook and the knight on d7, right? Something right. like queen g4, knight takes d7, and, and now the queen has... Uh, yeah. Has no good options. So I actually think that queen d3 might be... The only move? More, yeah. yeah, maybe more of a problem for, for Rodchenkov. And, and uh, the, 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 only move is, if it, the only move is to trade. Suddenly even lines like takes, takes, knight takes, b8. Black takes the rook on e2. And how do we stop the queen on e1? 
Right. For for a second, I thought queen f4 worked so that we would take the rook on b8, but maybe he would just be able to continue with rook b1 check after queen f4. So, okay, yeah, good point. Yep. Queen takes d3 seems like it is forced here. Yeah. Uh... Well, ni nice forcing move on uh, Black's part here. Yeah, I don't even know what he can do. Honestly, yeah. I don't I don't know how uh how white deals with this. So okay, well as I came to the board predicting a potential checkmate on the light squares, it took about 5 minutes for me to be completely wrong. So that's good. Yeah, right? I mean the, the, the first my first impression from this position was what is Black's king doing? Mm -hmm. White seems to have a crushing attack, but uh it just goes to show how how calculated these players are and they just know how to defend these positions like this. Always thinking many moves ahead. Let's go back. So let's see. We've got so many games going here. I don't even know oh, where. Oh, Artok just drew his game. Yeah, Very Artok. Nice. Artok's game is officially in the book. So off to another great start for Armenia, with a with an approach that is very straightforward. Hold hold a peaceful result against the top players, and uh, and let let guys like Andreasian do their thing on the top board. So yep. Uh, let's check in with another huge star of the Eastern Division who's underway, Vlad Dobrov is taking on Mikhail Demidov. Um, and uh, here, Dubrov is currently in kind of a, an awkward-looking position with pieces retreating themselves back to their original squares, like the knight on g8. But okay, one of the, this, is, this is kind of reminiscent to me of like a Sheveningen Sicilian, where even though Black's pieces seem, seem passive, there are no really long-term weaknesses here for Black. And with threats like f6 and maybe e5, Black can kind of slowly unwind um, that's, that's slight bias toward the fact that Dubrov mm -hmm. is a very strong player who I expect to be better in this matchup, but, uh, the more I look at it, the more I'm thinking, will he have time to do that? Here comes Rook H3, and we might have, uh, serious problems on H7. One, one crazy line might be, like, if F6, mm -hmm. the queen comes up to, I don't know, D3, threatening mate on H7. And your only move might be f5, leaving these two pieces on e5 and g5, and, and White's attack is still raging. So this is a, this is going to be very dangerous for Dubrov to deal with here. We could have, we could have an upset here with Demidov taking down the 2700 Grandmaster. Yeah, that's true. It's hard to figure out how Black is going to defend the position here. Um, maybe he's trying to think of h6 in the future. That's why his knight is on g8 to help okay. uh, support the pawn a little bit more in case White decides to sacrifice. But yeah, all of White's pieces are pointing towards his king. I'm a little bit nervous for him. I, I liked your move H6, actually. I felt like that was exactly how you would justify the knight being on G8. But no, Dubrov is apparently, he's not scared, right? He's not scared. Right. He plays F6. So you start thinking of Puzzle Rush, and you imagine if the bishop is gone from E8, then knight on G6 mm -hmm. would be checkmate right now. Right, right. Uh, but that's not the case, so... That would have been a really cute one. That would have been um, a cute one, right? You'd also you you start looking at tactics on h7 and the queen coming in, but none of these work because Dubrov's pieces are just perfectly yeah. placed. Yeah, that bishop on e8 is doing a lot of heavy lifting here, yep. protecting g6, not letting the queen come to h5. Somehow, even though most of his pieces are on on the eighth rank, they're doing an amazing job defending his king here. Yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm actually not sure whether white has anything as we look at it where's where's the next concrete move i mean let's go back to the move queen d3 though okay. if you play queen d3 what i'm starting to now that i'm starting to think maybe dubrov is just fine maybe then he plays your h6 alexandra after queen mm -hmm. d3 and okay. says i'm not scared at all my bishop does all the real important work guarding g6 and you may still actually just lose a piece here as white right right i mean if if white doesn't have any counterplay here his pieces are forked and he's gonna lose one of them i guess after queen d3 at least you have you know sacking on h6 and knight g6 but um we're, we're gonna have to see if he has anything here at least a perpetual <laughs> yeah should be noted by the way that both of these teams are brand new it's something we didn't highlight of course i saw some comments right about, about the uh, the team logos the team logos logos are really awesome right i mean the yes. moscow wizards logo it's like is that gandalf or is that a, you know oh, I, yeah. it's pretty Grand awesome yeah grandmaster robert hess was loving the uh, moscow wizards logo he actually wants to you know have it in some type of artwork so if anybody can do that you're gonna make uh, robert hess's day <laughs> yeah the uh but these are crosstown rivals yesterday yeah. or sorry on tuesday uh 
David and I were covering a crosstown matchup between the Montclair Sopranos and the New York Marshals, and here this right. is two Moscow teams going at it. Uh, Russian on Russian action here, and uh, this is going to be an interesting thing to see throughout the year as these two teams battle each other for uh, for crosstown supremacy, right? Should be exciting. Right, and I'm curious if, if one of them are favorites. Let me just quickly check their entire teams here. Um, they have a very similar rating average, yeah. and uh, th they do have a different strategy a little bit in terms of who they put on their board. Um, the Moscow Wizards are a lot closer in rating, a little bit over 100 points difference between board four and the, their top board, whereas the Moscow Phoenixes have a 2200 playing board four and a 2622 on board one. So yeah. we'll see how those two strategies pan out here. Let's let's check back in with uh, Zavin's game. Andreasen right. seems to have a uh, a pretty clear advantage here now. Oh no! Wait, no. What happened? I thought he was white I, I, for a second. Yeah, I, yeah. He's not. No, I, he, I thought he was doing better as as black here. Maybe we're. Maybe he's about to pr push on c1 and. Uh, no, no, after after rook c4, I think I think only white can win this. So let's back up on the analysis board here and try to see yeah. what happened. So, seems like the queens got traded off. No, yeah, they didn't. After right queen away. to d3. Yeah. After queen to d3, um, this was a position that we felt like white was getting overwhelmed. And hey, look at that move. Queen f4, proving us wrong. Queen yeah. f4 leaves everybody hanging. The knight is under fire. The rook is under fire. But That's the a... Oh, here's the combination we missed. You ready? Yes. After queen yes. f4, knight takes d7, puzzle rush time. Queen takes b8, check. Knight takes b8, I think. Yep. Rook to e8 check, king h7, bishop g6 forces the queens off, and now when we win the knight on b8, white's just up the exchange. Wow. What a beautiful tactic. Um, I guess... And that's actually exactly what happened in the yeah. game. I, I, didn't even, I didn't even see it, but that's exactly what happened. A combination that uh, Zavin missed, and now he will be fighting for a draw down right. the exchange. And actually, the way that Grandmaster Andreasen has positioned his pieces here seems to be the best way to try to defend. Um, his his bishop is protecting the pawn on a3, and the pawn on a3 will always protect the bishop. He doesn't have to worry about that. And with a bishop on b2, he can support g7, which is the the base of his pawn structure. So yep. the only thing you can try to do to def defend here. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It is well. That's a good point, though. The bishop does everything that it can, guarding a3 right. and g7 from a well-protected spot. So that that may actually prove to be key. But one of the one of the common issues in an in an endgame like this is that white combines the threat of both checkmate attacks yep. with the idea that you would sacrifice on a square like g7. And ultimate. Yep. In fact, I don't even know that Zavin will have time for that because here the rook comes to f7. Yeah. And if the king moves away from the g7 pawn, now Blight will simply take on g7 with the rook, as every transition into a king and pawn ending is just easily winning for white. Yeah, exactly. Because he can, if he can trade off his rook for a, a bishop and a pawn, and he's up a pawn, that's all he needs to win here. Yep. And and I think uh, Rodchenkov is is going to actually pull the huge upset. So we were just highlighting the storyline that Artok Manukin made a regular. A regular display of upsetting top players, like he did get a draw from Andraken on board one. But here, Rodchenkov returns the favor and takes down the PCL Finals hero, uh, Andre Austin. So amazing stuff. The other game's still in progress. Let's go back because there's only a minute on the clock left for the black player here. What's going All on right. in Sargisian's game? I'm coming right back to it. Uh, wow. Abdu Satorov is is. Probably, probably worse here combined. Uh, okay, he's up on the clock, but I, but I don't know that black can be any better after f3. The g3 pawn is going to fall safely, right? And white will have an extra pawn as we head into an endgame. But okay, with only a minute on the clock, it may yeah. not be, uh, may not yeah. be easy for Sargisian to win. Yeah, and and he doesn't have any uh, pass pawn in this position, so the fact that they're the pawns are on the same side of the board might make it a little bit harder to convert to a win since any pass pawn will be more easily blocked. Also, how how old is uh, Ab Abdu Satarov? He looks really young in his profile picture. I'm gonna have that, to look that's that. That's actually one out. just his baby picture. Okay, he's All actually right. a 50 year old man. So 
just his baby <laughs> picture. No, I, I, I'm kidding. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, he looks like a very uh, Abusatorov looks oh, like a very very say, young that's player. That's a good tactic. That's a good tactic. Oh, young talent. Terrifying. Young talent. Yeah, no, that's actually a great. I should upload a, a picture of when I looked younger. Maybe what I'll get mean? some. You're, you're still a young talent. Daddy. No, 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 no. I'm an I'm an over the hill. <laughs> Uh, failed chess prodigy, but oh wow! So Abdusatar was actually a chess prodigy. He qualified for the GM title when he was just thirteen. Wow! And right now he's fourteen years old. So um, okay, I guess well, he's not a fifty-year-old man, but that was a good guess, Danny. <laughs> he, he's gonna he's gonna have to do his best defending this position because I think Sargisian's gonna push it for a while. A lot of other games we could check in on. If we go back to Vlad Dubrov's game, uh, White is yeah. still White is still thinking here. Uh, also, Greg, thanks for uh, putting that out in the chat. We have Greg Shahadi, the uh, one of the creators of the Pro Chess League, actually, who came, who helped came, come up with this awesome system. So, yeah, shout out to Greg. Greg hanging out in the chat, the commission himself, and uh, shout out to everybody that's with us. We've already had a couple subscribers and some and some bits. Uh, sorry, we don't always shout those out during these types yeah. of big event streams, but we do appreciate all of your support. Yeah, and uh, thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Cashbank pointing out that you were actually number one in the U.S. under 19. Like we said, young talent. Now back to the games. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, Demidov, looks like Demidov did make his move just now. He played the move knight a4, which is a fork on the queen and bishop. Mm -hmm. And uh, white is going to try to create some sort of confusion so that you might find a way that black has to guard both ideas like the queen side as well as the king side. Note very quickly that all knight a4 does is try to force the bishop away from e8 because if bishop takes a4, knight, takes, mate, knight yeah. to g6 would be would be uh, a fun way yeah. to end this one. Yeah, you were just um, talking about how nice it would have been if the bishop was on, on e8. So that's yep. a nice attempt, obviously. But of course, Dubrov quickly backs up with the queen going to c7 and mm -hmm. uh, not going to get mated. So we'll come back and check on this one. There's, there's. Let's go back to the Sargisian game, just because we're about to see one, right. one potentially photo finish. Our first one of the day with Sargisian now less than 20 seconds, but still trying to win the extra pawn endgame here. Right. I, I get a feeling we're just about to see a little bit of uh, repetition here. Yeah, yeah. I think this one is is going to end in a draw, um, just because it, it's too hard to push an endgame like, like this with, with so little, little time. time. Yeah. Yep. But he's okay, trying, but so uh, shout out to him. Uh, it looks like he's he's threatening rook h8 here, so yeah. black is going to have to put his king back. Or that make would, be, that would his... be a mate problem. Yeah, that would be a mate problem. Let's not Wait get checkmated here. How does rook... Oh, rook h2 has, has, uh, has rook h3. If king g3 had been played there, there was no fork of mate and the rook because black would right. have had rook h3. Yep, good to point that out. That was my first But now he takes it, him. saying, you've gone for this trick... But now Abusator... I'm going to have an escape square on g5, and yeah. I have a pawn, so... Uh, and now uh, now I have a question. Is Abdusatarov going to push this on? Okay, uh, uh, he, he this... has no reason. Okay, yeah. no, he doesn't. He says, look, yeah. I've held the jaw, give it to me. But I said, hey, if my opponent's under 10 seconds, you know, we have dirty flag emotes on Twitch for a reason, okay? It's yeah, not... but we also have increment on chess for a reason. So. Good point, good point. And that's, why, <laughs> that's how we avoid those things. So Right, right. Uh, the game that to me is most exciting right now well, there's two that are getting close. Let's go to Tigra and Vava Chess. Yep. Okay, got it. Just found their game. Um, oh, I love seeing these unequal time positions with 55 seconds and five minutes. It's just... Yep. And here, this is Mikulevsky, Mikulovsky versus Savchenko. And uh, Savchenko has a big time advantage against the, the much lower rated opponent, as I guess he should. Right. Um, um, and it's... I don't know. I mean, at first glance, it looks like White's king is in a pretty awkward position. Both bishops are pointing towards him. There's pins everywhere. Uh, black doesn't... Black is... Uh, sorry, White is just trying to defend the position. I don't see any attack on his end. Yeah, and now there's even concrete ideas where you might take on g3 and look for something on h4. Right. Uh, you'd have to try to deflect this knight away from f3. Taking right away wouldn't wouldn't be advised for Black. Mm -hmm. But it, it it just puts White in a really tough position, and I like Bishop d6 as an instructional moment for the viewers, Alexandria, because it shows that when your Danny opponent's putting his uh, coach hat on, let's yeah, let's exactly. hear. I'm, I'm going to try to do my position. best, but yeah, I think it's important do. when your opponent's under time pressure 
to not try to always play the most obvious forcing moves. Sometimes we, right. we try to force our way through thinking, oh, they won't be able to calculate this, but often the easiest moves to find when you have no time are just the forced recaptures, the checks, the obvious things. And mm -hmm. so if he, I wouldn't be surprised if he just plays a move like bishop, bishop back here. Okay, the b4 knight is hanging, but so right. is the f3 knight. Right. So I'm looking um, at something like a subtle bishop b8 and make your opponent calculate with 30 seconds things things like queen takes b4 and bishop takes f3, which could just be a super, super huge yeah. mess for white. But, but a good question, and I think a very instructive one as well, is should you not just be trying to make the best moves? Because what if your opponent figures it out even if they're low on time? Yep. But... Okay, yeah, well, we'll, I mean, we'll... if you have an option between equally interesting moves and there's a line that's a little bit more complicated and focuses and forces your opponent to calculate, I, I do like that strategy a lot. Yep. Well, uh, Subchenko taking his time here. We're going to stay right on this board because he's got a big decision. Do I, do I play a subtle move like a retreat or did I go for the forcing line? And again, I just like that move because now... And now, worst case scenario, white goes back to d2 with the knight, which is a, mm -hmm. a repeat of the previous position. But you've put your opponent under even more time pressure. And uh, instead, this is what happens, right? Instead, they don't want to repeat because they don't want to lose on time. They're like, well, I got to do something. And they right. make a move like knight d4, which probably wasn't the best move here. Yeah, uh, you're right. He was afraid. The The threat on F3 was scary. He just moved his knight as fast as he could to what was a relatively safe-looking square. I mean, then, with five seconds, what else can you do? And then Subchenko quickly plays a move like A6, so he's just sort of sitting tight, doesn't even need to find the, the knockout blow just yet because White's going to have to play the next series of moves with less than 10 seconds. Right, okay, and White doesn't have any obvious ideas here. He's Okay, King yeah. G1, that makes sense. Trying to try to get the king off that dangerous square. Yeah, exactly. So here, black can play moves like knight e5 and try to come into f3. Note that note that there is no queen takes d5 because of knight f3 discovered check and and winning the queen. Right, right. Um, and uh, yeah, black also doesn't want to take on g3 right away. Just having the pawn on f4, exerting that pressure, maybe allowing for f3 or g3 when the time is right makes a lot more sense here. So keeping the position as complicated as he can. Uh, Bo uh, Grandmaster Savchenko is also taking his time here. Yeah, he, he's getting lower as well. Yeah, two minutes is not a lot of time. Okay, he, he finds knight b6, and mm. Mikulovsky could quickly plays knight d2, but now, now I'm expecting something to happen here. Yeah, bishop b4, very nice move. Pins the knight to d2, uh, the rook on e1. In fact, now I think we're just going to see material loss. I don't see why. Yeah. Does okay, bishop if black takes f3? f3, white does have the small intermezzo bishop takes, which gains a tempo on the queen. But even that, yeah, he takes g3 first. Now he could take, and on bishop takes, a move like queen f7 is lights out. And I think that's what he's... Okay, yeah. or queen or, g6. Or queen g6, yeah. yeah. And we have a double attack, two pieces hanging, the g3, g3. pawn and the knight. And so yeah. goes, he's going to put this one away in style here in just a few moments. Yep, very nicely done. Um... Tough first result for their board four. Uh, they are going to need him to to pull off a couple upsets, but that's okay. It doesn't have to be the first round. If we go back to the game with uh, Demidov versus Vlad Dubrov, actually looks like uh, Dubrov has done just everything he was supposed to do, which is mm -hmm. defend off the attack and maintain a time advantage. Black is just up a piece here, so we expect... The, uh, the Moscow Wizards to maintain what is already a starting lead against their crosstown rival. If Dubrov takes this one and uh, and Subchenko does what he's supposed to do against Mikhailovsky, we will yep. have a three and a half to a half lead, I believe, heading into the second set of games for the Wizards. Yep, yep, that's a huge starting advantage. Um, it looks like the Armenian Eagles and the Volga Stormbringers drew have their first match with 2-2. Yep, 2-2 two, two apiece, and in fact, their second set of games is just getting underway. We'll check in on those in a minute. Right. But there's a, there's a whole other match that we haven't even talked about yet, and let's pop over to a game here between Malev12, if you're following the usernames on chess.com, mm -hmm. which is Jan Elvist, for those who don't know. Um, and uh, he's taking on, well, one of the movers with the black pieces here, and I... Uh, First sight, I thought that white had some pressure because I only looked at black's king having uncastled by hand. But the more you look at it, the more you see just a dominant knight on c4. And if right. anything, white's king might be worse off than black's king here on e1. 
Yeah, at least, yeah, neither side was able to castle, but um, black does seem a lot more safe here. Uh, white pushed both pawn, both side pawns to a4 and to h4, so if black is a ever able to get into the back rank, it looks pretty scary for white to defend this. Um, yeah, and I, I, I was looking at the results from last year. The Mumbai movers did slightly better than the Estonian horses, so let's see if Estonia is able to switch up the results this year. But good for them. Both of them made it. Both of them made it to the quarterfinals. So strong teams here. Well, as you see on the screen right now, everyone, we're following this live game and uh, between Swami Nathan and Elvis. But a reminder of what we've already seen, of course, mm -hmm. the standings from the Atlantic and Pacific are in the books because they played on Tuesday. And uh, what we have here going down right now is the Eastern Division followed by the Central Division. Yep. Um, I very nice production value. I love it. Uh, the pro chess league keeps getting better every year. Okay. Oh, it looks like uh, Jan just took on a four, so he is trying to open up the a file in this position, which makes sense given that White's king is on e one, can't go to d two, can't escape to the h file. Uh... Yeah, I think uh, Malev is, is uh, meaning Jan Elvis is about to take this one here. Yeah. For yeah. the Estonian horses, this looks really rough for White. True. Okay, so we haven't talked anything any about this match, but what else is going on in this match up here? Let's check on Champ two thousand and five. Okay. Uh, who is Sadwani versus Ladva, and uh, this is a a much much closer matchup on paper, much even to start, and the position also looks much more unbalanced. I kind of like White's chances. The international master Sadwani with with a decent. Decent position here. In fact, feels like Black, if anything, should be worse in the end game. This weak e7 pawn, mm -hmm. uh, and just the fact that White's pieces are more coordinated. Now, saying that, I don't see a concrete plan for White. Right. Uh, but right. what happens on a move like Knight to c5 for White? The question is, if I go after the a6 pawn and you have to give up your bishop, what's the better dynamic to have, the bishop or the knight on on c6? I feel like the bishop should be a better minor piece in this end game. So Advani didn't do that. Okay. Oh, so he, wow. He, he just traded it off completely. The opposite um, happened. The bishop traded off for the knight. So now white has the knight versus the I think white's still better here, even with the opposite minor piece dynamic happening. But uh, right. I wonder if I wonder if knight c5 was better. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, like you said, white, white's pieces are still more coordinated here. Um, I guess white later on, where, where would the best position for his knight be right now? Probably if, I mean, okay. Fantasy chess, we'd like to put it somewhere on, on C6 or, or D5 on a light square right. where it's dominant. But I don't know that it's really that bad off right where it is on E4. One, because there's no clear path to remaneuver the knight to either of these squares. True. So and... it seems like White is, instead of remaneuvering his knight, as you said, it's already a good on, on a good square, moving his king a little bit closer. Even if he can't come right away, it's always good to move your king up and have it be more Close active the in the end game, even yep. if it's just on G2 instead of G1. It might save a tempo later down the road. And this 9 on E4 is, is sort of on an outpost square, not the most yeah. traditional, obvious outpost right, square. But right. because this pawn is on E7 and there are no D and F pawns, that means there's really no way for Black to ever get rid of this beast here. And I really like this move C4. What White's trying to do is, say if Black takes it, he'll take with the Rook, and now we have a whole new set of weaknesses. The A6 pawn, the C7 pawn, threats like Rook A4 and Rook C6. So the way you win this sort of end game, if you can, is you, you keep your knight, or you keep your opponent's counterplay at bay, and that's what the knight's doing by guarding the f2 pawn. And and then you hope you, you can create new avenues for your rooks to find targets. If I'm yep. black here, you just you just stare at this trade, right? Staring contest. You don't want to, you <laughs> definitely don't want to take, and, and rook f5 is a good move. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Black would love white to take on b5 and take back with his pawn, but white is not going to do that either. Um, interesting that he's trying to get the rook trade here. Um, so yeah, I, I like I like that. In fact, I think that yeah. this is getting closer to a position where Sadwani will will be able to push. This pawn on c4 is threatening c5, and that might even be a trap mm -hmm. bishop on d6 if you're not careful. Yep, he's taking advantage of Black's misplaced bishop on d6. But, here. but let's hop back to the game between Malev 12 and Swaminathan because it's about to end. As oh, Malev no. 12 oh, oh gosh. Has okay. just finished things off with a very nice combination to show everybody here. After bishop to d2, black instantly took on d2 and then applied the fork on c4. And uh, yeah. 
And just like that, the Estonia horses have jumped out to a one to nothing lead. So if Jan Elvis does his job as the top board, which this, he is so far, so that's good. Which he just did. So the question is, will someone like Audibon do his job, uh, mm -hmm. or Ab Abimanyu? Sorry, Puranik. I confuse usernames versus Paul six 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 six. That's uh, Grandmaster Kana. How many sixes was that? All right, I got it. But uh, so. This will be a big one here. Mm -hmm. The um, an interesting GM on GM matchup, even for one of the early rounds between these two teams, right? Right. And uh, well, I mean, from first glance at this position, I I I think it's easy to like White's position better. Yeah. White has a pass pawn on e6. Yep. Black's pawns have all been pushed. They're not defending his king so well anymore. Um, White's king is safe. His rooks are active. Uh, let's let's see how he's going to. How do you how do you put this back. one away? I mean, it feels yeah. like White really should have. I mean, e7 is a move that comes to mind because after the queen takes, yeah. you have numerous forks. Knight c6 uh -huh. or knight g6 would be. Yeah, even knight c6 next move looks pretty scary. Right, instead of e7, because now you're just threatening e7. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I like that. Okay, wow. knight c6. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if this one doesn't go much longer, and if that means that Grandmaster. Canop is about to also help help the horses with a victory. Then uh, looks like they're going to be off to an early early lead here. Yeah, incredible. Um, the uh, okay, so Canop versus uh, Puranik here looks like Canop is going to take this one. We'll try to come back to it as it gets more exciting. I want to go back to this game here mm -hmm. between Sadwani and Ladva because I think we're about to see kind of an instructive ending for White, um, which. I don't know. Sometimes I think having having an interesting and and well displayed technique is sometimes even more even more interesting to cover than the exciting tactics. So, all after... right. Well, let's take a look then. Uh... So White has to find a way to get access to these weak pawns here. Um, the other thing that Black has against him is that there's a clear path for a second weakness on the on the king side with this sort of king march <laughs> up the board. And a pawn like h6 is an eventual target. So you've got this really tough spot if you're black where white is in control of all the cards, right? You've got pressure mm -hmm. on the queen side. You may be threatening sort of a king rush over here to the uh, to the king side. In yep. fact, h4 is a very nice move because you're just creating the, the chance that when you do get this uh, this entryway here, your, your h pawn is going to be instantly passed. Right. So Lava Lava's in a really tough spot here. Yeah. Um, and his time is doing him no favor either. Uh, it looks like he just dropped the a6 pawn, so white, at the very least, is going to be up a pawn well, here. His right, threat so is rook g4, and indeed he plays it. And I was wondering if Sadwani would ah, allow this, because I guess what he's going to do is just guard the knight with either f3 or king f3, and then take mm -hmm. the c6 pawn. Right, yeah. right. So... so he plays the king there instead. The next move he'll take on c6, I'm assuming, as mm -hmm. soon as black gobbles h4. Right. Um... And this should be a win for Sadwani, which is a much needed win, right? Because we're expecting yeah. Canep. Elvis already won for the horses. Canep yep. is going to win. So this is this is something that the movers really need, which is an upset with Sadwani taking down Grandmaster Ladva. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I, I guess we should we should stick around for a little bit longer because it seems like this game is just about to wrap up. Yeah, I think so. Um, especially with only six seconds for Ladva, but I was. Looking for where the other game is between the uh, the movers and the horses, and I found it. It's actually one we should probably check on, because yeah, it's okay. the one and only Bador Jababa versus Tanya Sachdev. So two of the biggest names playing this week, okay. right? You've got Lexi Sexy versus Tanya S here, as far as chess.com usernames, if you want to follow it on your own time there, fans. Yes. But it looks like Jababa is... Doing what you would expect him to do is the much higher rated player, mm -hmm. um, but but uh, Tanya's not out of it yet. Although the more I look at it, how do you deal with this threat on B2? It, this is going to be, you know what? Yeah. I, and I just realized I'm wrong. This is not a matchup between the movers and the horses. This is the this is the uh, Tbilisi gentleman yeah. versus the Delhi Dynamite. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. No, Tanya seems like she's. She was a little bit outplayed to get into this position because she's not doing worse material-wise. It's just that all of her pieces are slightly worse placed than Blacks are. Um, and that's something that is pretty typical when you're playing somebody higher rated. Yep. You might not instantly lose material, but slowly by slowly, your opponent is going to gain the advantage. And 
that, that's exactly what it looks like from yeah and now now black white. is just black is uh just yeah. in control of how to how to convert this one right if white plays right. passive moves like rook b1 yeah rook b1 what else are what else is white gonna do here right i um, mean you could even take c3 and gobble a4 i probably wouldn't do that because why why trade off any of my dominant pieces but i'm sure right. that jababa will come up with something let's yep. go back let's see there's a couple games about to have potential photo finishes um back to the game here between champ 2005 and uh, Agzer, the uh, the Ladva game looks like Sadwani's going to take this one. This knight's coming to e6. Okay. And it's uh, I don't know exactly how Black deals with that. Um. The other game between yeah Adi Adi Davi and uh, Paul six Paul with a million sixes. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Uh, that's that's maybe he did that so we focus less on his game. You know, too yeah. hard to say. They're not gonna look at my game. No pressure at all. Well, we we I love playing the why is that username what it is game, and I'm always right. trying to guess birthdays. You know, um, uh, maybe Paul six was taken. So was right. Paul sixty six. So right. was Paul six hundred sixty six. Right. So he just, you know he was just website, doing so taking what was now. available. It makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But all right. Jokes aside, uh, Mr. Canep, despite his very interesting username is is going to take this one home here and again help the estonia horses probably take a lead into the second round of play yeah so they're, um, they're probably gonna end up with three one nice i'm guessing yeah so yeah. uh looks like sadwani is about to finish this one as well he'll be winning the bishop with check on c7 as he just did we see it on the analysis board you can keep the mm -hmm. live board there on canet versus peronek because we got time pressure um in fact, I'll go back to it as well, just to make sure we don't miss any crazy finishes. Black is Black is trying yeah. to help help his chances with something a last ditch try with the F one. Right. Um, and White only has ten seconds, so so maybe maybe there's a chance. Yeah, I mean he he, he just he just lost his his only counterplay here, really. But I guess it does make sense. But I was wondering what happens Black... on knight g four ninety three. Is this what what does he calculate? I guess he. He plays knight f3, which also comes to d2. I was wondering, where's the the fast entry way for the white rook to help? Right. Um, okay, I guess that's all you need. <laughs> when you have another pass pawn, you have a and h pawns. That's all yeah. you need, apparently. Yeah. Okay, Canop okay. is... Uh, now, in... in uh, a pretty easy spot to put this away. That knight has self-trapped on a3. And uh, there's even lines like this, Alexander, where the king will come to d1. White will just... I'll just show it on the analysis board so everyone can understand why white's winning here. Okay. The, the threat, if something like king g7, is to play king to d1, take on e1. And what happens in the end of this line is the knight is just completely stuck. Mm-hmm. And the A pawn will run, right? So Black did do the job of blockading the H pawn, and indeed, uh, Pernick even created some counterplay with the F pawn. But in the end, two pass pawns are better than one, and the A pawn is going to run up the board. So, um, yep. nicely so put there. That's why that was over. Uh, so many other games to cover. Hardly enough time. The uh, the right. match between the Tbilisi gentleman and the Delhi Dynamite is now well underway. The other game that we talked about, or the other name we talked about, excuse me, was Nihal Sarin, the rising young star. Some people say with him and Pragnananda, that's not sure who's going to become the next Anand there from India. Um, a lot, that's a big name to live up to. That is true. No pressure at all, right? No pressure. Just live up to one of the greatest chess players of all time. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, fair enough. I mean, 14-year-old uh, GM, he has a chance to do it. Yep. Uh, um, the, uh, the young, the young player is, is better here, I think, as black. So, we're, yeah, we're looking at the game between Volkov and Sarin. Yep. The pass B pawn and the fact that the A4 pawn is a target that can't be defended is why I like black so much. I mean, the last ditch try you start thinking is, is Volkov calculating queen g5 here and, you mm -hmm. know, maybe he'll miss checkmate, right? Why not? Uh, <laughs> wishful thinking, wishful but thinking. okay. Um, but the, the real issue I... is that white just lacks counterplay. You're just down a pawn, a very clear one on b4. And because you have a dark square bishop and not a light square bishop, there's no way to defend a4 as well. So we, we right. believe Sarin should take this one home. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yep, white doesn't actually have any attacking threats here, so it's just going to be a pawn dropping. Knight d2 makes sense. White's trying to bring the pieces towards uh, black's two pass pawns on the queen side, but it's not going to be enough to fight well, them off. We we had a whole bunch of results just in. Let's just check on uh, Bador Jababa did indeed take down Tanya Sachdev. No surprise, that's what Jababa's supposed to do there. Uh, Paul, with a whole bunch of sixes, as we already highlighted, did what he was supposed to do in that game. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, Sadwani did get the best of Ladva here. It took a little while, but just to make sure everyone knows that those are the results we've had in the books. As the, as the second round games are really underway here, and we're about to check in with some really exciting chess, including some time pressure in the Armenia Eagles game. Let's remind everybody how they can get involved with the league. Social media is uh, is a thing that's here to stay, Alexandra. Not sure you got the memo. But, oh, uh, really? Social yeah, you know media what? is a thing? It's not going anywhere. And here we have some great pictures. Mm -hmm. Chessify, one of the sponsors of the Armenia Eagles, sharing an image. Look at that. That's impressive. Yeah, all they... four. That's awesome. That's a great That's a great picture. You got Artak Manukin there all the way in the back. Zavin Andreasian, right. Sargisian there. Uh, and, uh, okay, the other tweet right below it, we've got Nahal Sarin. Uh, being being the lowest board here this year. He he was the lowest board, as they were saying, for the Dynamite. Now he's the top board for the Dynamite. So kind of cool yeah. when you have a storyline like that. Somebody who's been playing in the league long enough to be both board four and now board one for their team. No, it is. And with somebody improving that rapidly, it's even more inspiring. But yeah, I, I do like what you said. They, we have to be appreciative to people who are helping sponsor and make the Pro Chess League co become a reality. The Armenian Eagles have a great space, great managing team. Hopefully, we'll see more of this as the years go on. As we as we see, Sauron should do what he's supposed to do here. Let's go back to the Armenia Eagles matchup with the Vogel Stormbringers because it's uh it's about to get rainy for Volga. Oh, right. okay. First cool. first bad pun of the day, Stormbringer. Oh, so, I was waiting for it. Zav I, I Zavin Andreasin's game. Zavin Andreasin's game versus Mikhail Gorazan. Whoa, uh, the king is on E2. What is yeah, going but, on? But the, but the queen is being lost. So I the was king, uh, yeah. I was following it for the last few moves. Let's back up on the analysis board to show exactly how Zavin launched this attack because it, wow. was, it was pretty exciting. Back in this position here. Zavin uh, cleaning up. Yeah, let's see how he pulled this off. It was, it was kind of a, I don't want to say bullet special, right? Hikaru Nakamura style, but Zavin said, I don't care about anything but checkmate, and immediately launched the H-pawn as far back as move 7 with yeah. the move H4, and just went all in on the attack here. Yeah, and, It looks uh, a little bit like a bully attack, where he's yeah. just taking advantage of his opponent being slightly weaker. Um, yeah, but seriously, right? Because how often do you just launch an attack like this and just checkmate your opponent? But it looks like that's what White's going to do. Yeah. Very, this is this is a nice instructive game for uh and and and, and I like you said this. Let's okay. highlight exactly why this worked cuz people might be like, "Wow, is chess that easy? Why can't I just push Harry to victory every single game, right?" Right. Well, the reason this works here is because with White having the pawn on e5 so early, that ensures there's no knight on f6 and it's like, "Thanks, Captain mm -hmm. Obvious," but it's it's an important feature because the pawn structure is typically what gives you sort of the license to kill so to speak, when it comes to attacks like this. If you have an open center with a bunch of files, or if you have minor pieces in the center, it's much harder to just shut your eyes and launch a full-bore attack on one side of the board. But in this sort of weird structure, Black not only allowed White to keep the center closed, but voluntarily kind of created these dark square weaknesses with the Fianchetto. So as much right. as you're like... I'm going to play chess like this. There's actually a lot of little features about this position that are kind of signals to the fact that white can get a very successful attack. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. what happened here. So Zavin just pushes h4, recognizing that he has the, this potential we've highlighted. And uh, and then it's just all in, right? The center is closed enough for him to get a full attack. And there exactly. was no looking back. And I'm just going to say, for those of you who in these variations play the French exchange. You're living your life wrong. Look That's at this right. game and find how to play the king. Thank you. The <laughs> first the first <laughs> slam against the French we've had in the 2019 Pro Chess League, at least from my broadcast. So that makes well, me so happy. I, I do I do feel personally offended when people play into the French exchange. So well, I just needed to push that out there. <laughs> given that one of our regular co-hosts this year, of course, will be Anna Rudolph, and we know that she is a French aficionado. I uh, also love playing the French. I just 
I don't like it when people take on D5, so I think it's okay. <laughs> anyway, but I'm not going to go into how bad the French is. We'll leave that to Robert next time he hosts with right. you. Right. We um, don't want but, both of you guys to be wrong. Okay. So but next. but again, if you look if you look at the structure, jokes aside, everyone, this is this is why this attack works. It's a closed structure where black has no pieces naturally defending the king side, so white was able yeah. to go all in. And as we see Zavin on the live position, about to just clean this one up. Uh, yeah. That's that's why the attack worked, and if you're and and you should recognize that because if you're in in games where you have that type of structure, that is sort of a little bit of an alarm clock, a little bit of a signal like, hey, maybe I actually have the uh, the yeah. opportunity to be all in very early on here. And I think another important instructive tidbit would be, well, what should have Black done instead? What could he have done so that the attack didn't work? Right? Um, to well, try I, to. I I think that for starters, um, the. Uh, the opening was super strange. I think the move G6 is just a super risky approach in this. Yeah. So what Zavin did against the French here was was play the the King's Indian attack kind of version of the French, where you keep the pawn on D3 rather than D4 and right. hopes for flexibility. But this move G6, when you've already played E6 and opened up the dark squares on this side of the board, which is kind of yeah. where the bishop should belong, it's just very it's very risky to play so many pawn moves and create so many potential weaknesses early on and. And yeah, Zavin just exactly. just does exactly what you would do. So I would say that this line with G6 and E6 is already asking right. for it. Yeah. Um, uh, but normally you would see something like C5 and Blackwood uh, places Bishop instead on E7 or Castle a little bit later. Well, on that note, I actually think you make. Yeah. I think that's that's maybe what Black should have done. Even though he's already <laughs> played G6, I think you make a good point that probably Black's best chance is to maybe play a move like H5 himself back on move six and then go back to C5, Knight C6 bring the queen out, play something like this, which right. looks like a normal French, and you're not just letting your opponent, you know, full steam ahead on the H file here. Yeah, yeah. Good good explanation. All right, well, Zavin is doing what he's supposed to do. Uh, Nihal Sarin, if we check back in on that matchup uh, with the black pieces, is uh, is about to beat Volkov, looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. still, still way up on the clock and still much better. Yep. So checking on some other games here. Let's, Let's go to Artok Manukin's game because Yeah, the, we haven't seen Artok in a while. The manager is in a world of hurt here against the uh the super talented junior, as we've uh, now come to know that is not just his baby picture. He's actually that <laughs> old. So if he looks like a really adorable, kind of chubby little kid, that's who he is. He yes. also just happens to be a super dangerous grandmaster. Exactly. So, um uh, Abdu Satorov is, uh, jokes aside, is just a beast, and I think Rook C6 here looks really good. Yeah. You, you highlighted earlier, Alexandra, you want your king more active than the counterpart in the end game, and this is this is a position that highlights exactly why. White's advantage is not just about this extra pawn on D5, but the dominant the dominant king is going to lead lead his army to victory here. Right, and he knew that from earlier on in the game. He was just posi positioning his pieces, ready to get into a position like this. Um, yeah, he has all the space advantage in the world. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard for him to convert this win here. Rook h1 makes sense. He's going to take advantage, maybe put his rook on h8. His black's king is going to be in a bad position. He'll have to be careful about checkmates and losing the pawn on f7. So. Yeah. And in fact, there's a move like king c5 coming in. You're, you're going to have trouble. Not often that a king gets to fork a rook and a knight. Right. But hey, it happens, right? It happens. There and you it, go. end games are the best time for that. So yep. All right. Well I think Manukian is in trouble here. We know that Artok does his best to be to be valiant for the Eagles. Um, but I think uh, I think there's a chance that not a chance. I think he's going down here against the uh, the, the studly junior of Dusatorov. Yeah. But um, hey, he did win, he did draw his first game um, against the strong. But sticking sticking with this matchup, unfortunately, a game we didn't get to touch on. That's one of the things about the Pro Chess League. There's a lot of things going on. But let's go right. at least note the result. Uh, to Vladimirovich, 90, did take down Shant Sargisian. Um, and uh, that's a big win for the Stormbringers. If we look at, again, a really instructive kind of final position here on Draken with a super dominant king an awesome knight, and just a bad bishop behind the structure. So another reason not to play the French, right, Alexandra? Because then you just have horrible <laughs> endgames. Uh, yeah. Actually, for the, you'll get a pretty good endgames out okay, of the yeah, French. Okay, yeah, yeah. At right. least there's that. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, Vladimirovich gets this win for the Stormbringers. Yeah. And with Artak Manukin just falling, you saw that result go down on the live position. I'm catching up to it on the analysis board. Uh, that means that 
the uh, the Stormbringers are in position to have a lead. Yep, um, it's four three right now for the Stormbringers. But but Zavin Andreas, yeah, exactly. Zavin did to convert that game with a very nice attack that we followed. In fact, it ended with a checkmate on Knight to C seven, so that's nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that means that we have Mickey Tarion. Uh, fighting to keep the Eagles tied as they head into the third round of play. So let's go check out this game here. Yeah, let's, um, let's check versus that out. Brodchenkov. Uh, okay. I don't think I don't think uh, Materiosian is is holding this one as black. I think we're gonna see a five three lead for the Stormbringers head into the next round because we have a uh, a newborn baby girl on A eight, and I don't think that uh, that black has anything to go with that. I, I really like that uh, the newborn baby girl. Yeah, cute. It's uh, it's uh, she's in the delivery room. It's about to happen. So here <laughs> we go. White's pushing here. Okay. <laughs> the the A eight queen is coming, and there's nothing black can do about it. I would expect actually, uh, Materiasian to to probably resign here pretty soon because I think it's over. Um, yeah. Um. So that means that the Stormbringers, you know what they're doing? They're bringing the thunder. They are. The Stormbringers are. are bringing the thunder right now. They uh, are. Um, yeah, and la last oh, wait, year... Wait a they... second. I have the board flipped around? For the game between Rochenko and Martriosian? I had the board flipped around. I was seeing oh, it no. from the wrong side. <laughs> LOL. 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 You know what we just did there? We PCLOL'd. Pro Chess League Out Loud. That's what we okay, did. Okay, you like the acronyms. I'm getting I, the hang. I, of I love it. Yeah. And so okay. we we just we just but PC LOL TM. Uh. Wow. Okay. Uh, my bad. My I thought it was. Oh, but you should have called me out on that. I mean, I. You're right. No, it was it was blame Alexander. I'm sorry, Danny. I, I agree. I mean, I. Oh, <laughs> I I was sitting. I had the board wrong, and I was looking oh. at it from uh from White's perspective, uh, Black's perspective instead of White's, and yeah, uh, that's what I, happened. I had it, I had it, didn't have time to open the position yet, so I was watching it from the Twitch stream to make sure I caught up. Yeah. So, uh, next time. No, it's a, it's a, uh, obviously my fault. But okay, so now we're reevaluating what uh, looks to be a much more unclear position. Uh, in fact, if anything, okay. I'm, now I'm just so afraid to speak. Materiasan's a pawn does look strong, but the truth is, I'm not going to change my mind that Rodchenkov is in control because the f pawn combined with the c pawn threatening to run up the board uh, are, I think, going to be too much for White here. Right, Although, and it. And it's uh, easier for Black to stop White's pass pawn from moving forward here, but White's knight is uh, distracted, protecting the f pawn, and can't also take care of c here. But okay, what's what's the concrete approach here? Because if you move the knight from b5, the a pawn mm -hmm. runs. Uh, you, you mean if you move the the Black knight? Yeah, if you move the Black knight from b5, then the a pawn runs. So what? How does? Well, it seems like he can just go C4, C3, right? What's stopping the C-pawn from just pushing Running down the board? the board? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess I thought the G-pawn could compete with the C-pawn, but I guess a real problem is that this queen comes with check. Right. And, uh, so he's going to try to compete with the C-pawn, but, but it's not going to be fast enough because black will be getting a queen with check and then maybe even mating the white king. Let's look at this. Takes... C4, G6, C3, G7, C2. We got a couple of a uh, couple of baby girls joining the fight on G8 and C1, but I feel like Black is just going to get some sort of nasty mating attack with with Queen C7 at the end of these kind of lines. Right. Um, and it, it's an interesting point that one of the biggest risks of this type of pawn race endgame is not just whether you can compete with your opponent's pawn and get a queen, but if the other person gets a queen with check. Or it's yes, the first one yeah. to check, it very often leads to to disaster. Yeah, I, I think uh, if you remember the big chess movie, Searching for Bobby Fischer, um, in, jo in Josh's last game, that's exactly what happened. He promoted the queen with a check. It was a very iconic chess movie scene that also points to the principle you just talked about. Yep. The uh, I guess I should have just been following chat. I just took the first moment to look at it, and everyone was yelling at me about having the board wrong. So. <laughs> Both uh, in both Chess TV and Twitch TV slash Chess, we are following chat. Apparently, not closely enough. Um, um, that's okay, chat. Next time, just yell yell harder and uh, just yell harder, and then I can hear you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Just that kidding. that makes sense. So, uh, 
Uh, well, we, we, we can't expect you to do everything perfectly. Picking the games, taking care of OBS, you know. Well, I have a producer the dad now. Jokes. Shout out to Aaron, the producer. Let's get a Studio C shot so that everyone knows yeah. what's going on behind the Shout scenes. I, we do have much more people involved in this. That's there true. he is. That's the guy right there doing all the hard work. MVP. MVP. You, you wish that Georg Meyer would just put away the gun already. Put it away, Georg. Um, Han, <laughs> Hans, Hans Meyer there, Georg Gruber. Oh. Um, this is, this is anyway, the but, high, high production value we're here for. All right. Yep. All right. Well, it, it looks like White just calculating lines like we just talked about is in, is in yeah. big trouble. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess we can come back to this and see if the end game played out like we yep. expected to. Um, the uh, the Storm, not sorry, not the Stormbringers, but the Crosstown matchup. Let's go back to Vlad Dubrov's game. Now yeah, against Mikhailovsky. Let's see if the uh, Moscow Phoenixes can try to take back some points in the second round, because three and a half to to half is a pretty uh, depressing way to start off the match. I love people in the chat loving the fat heads. They see Fabiano in the background. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Magnus likes being on the floor. Yeah, do, okay, do you don't, think that's, if we use their heads wanted to be. in front of us, we would get? you know, plus 200 ELO. I feel like we would. I, I've been trying that for a long time. It doesn't work, actually. It doesn't work? Okay, it doesn't well, work. Um, thank you. Thank you for confirming. In fact, where was it? Did they see Hikaru's eyebrows? I'm sure they did. Hikaru's always here, watching, waiting, judging. Judging. Lurking. Um, True. The, uh, all right. So Vlad Dubrov is leading the Moscow Wizards. Yes. Uh, yes, he, he did is. win his first game and looks like... Okay, he's well. He's definitely favored against Mikhailovsky, although right now he doesn't look to have a, a great position. Um, uh, you're, yeah, you're right. Actually, I was expecting to tune into this game and see him having a, a big advantage here, but no, not yet. It looks pretty drawish, actually. Um, obviously, in terms of material, uh, no side is winning. Not, White has his knight on c5. It's a little bit more active, but in exchange, Black has a, a bishop on f5, has an open b file. It does seem White's a little bit more defensive here. Yeah, I'm wondering how White can untangle. You would think Dubrov is playing for a win as the stronger player. Um, but with Black owning the only open file on the board here, this b right. file, I'm right. starting to think Dubrov's plan might be something like rook d to d2. Which yep. is probably why he just played rook d1, followed by challenging the b file by by putting a rook on b2. Not sure which one that'll be. Um, so I, I yeah. see a plan for white now to kind of untangle. So the question then becomes, what can Mikhailovsky do while he still owns these files? Right. And, and normally what would happen in these types of positions is black would be able to double his rooks, but he can't play rook b3 because of the knight on c5. Yep. So he's going to have to come up with another plan here. And One thing is... he could try is distracting the knight from c5 with knight d7, but then, uh -huh. uh, right, because white's knight is much better placed than black's knight, but right. then that would also bring black's bishop back here. But what I was going to highlight is that the other long-term features, even though the first thing we pointed out is white's pieces don't seem that active, black does mm -hmm. own the open files, the long-term targets of the position really favor white because there's only one pawn that's really a weakness, and that's the d5 pawn because it's on a light square for this bishop, whether mm -hmm. it comes to a6 and b7 or, or something like b5 to c6 or even something that doesn't seem possible at all right now, finding its way to like the A2 diagonal. But the point is that when you're looking at positions like this, it's not just about the current activity, but who actually has targets, who has weaknesses to gang up on. And the more I look at the position, the more I actually think that Dubrov is, I don't want to say in control, but but doing just fine because um, I don't see a plan for black. I think that Dubrov can just play rook A1 now and, and kick that bishop out. That's what he yeah, does. Yeah, bishop B1 was... was uh... A little bit of a weird move. It kind makes of a move that he didn't know what to do. And now, and now we're yeah. going to come back to that plan. I think Dubrov's going to follow through with what I was saying. Rook A2, yeah. Rook B2. And and the problem is that if everything starts to go, if the pressure goes away, if the if the smoke clears and all that's left is a weakness on D5, mm -hmm. uh, White, White will be the one pushing for a win down the stretch. So um, That's true. Although I still like the idea of Black trading off his knight for White's knight on C5 and then trying to defend the deep pawn with his with his light squared bishop because yeah, it's what hard because you're you're definitely yeah. creating an end game there if you did that you're creating an end game where white you know white's playing for two results because again the only weakness is d5 this bishop at best is kind of a big pawn defending it so you mm -hmm. know I, I think this is i think this is tougher for black than we first thought um yeah. and uh it's 
I guess, a good lesson for us to th keep the big picture in mind. At first I was like, oh, black's fine. And then I'm like, actually, wait a second. There's weaknesses here that white, uh, it's only a matter of time before white gets to him. So we'll see what happens here. We have a result in the books, just to point out, uh, Rudchenkov did take down uh, Materiasyon, which means the Stormbringers are indeed taking that 5-3 lead into the third round of play. So um, the Eagles have got to rally themselves as the top boards now start to battle. Um, okay. Well, if they have anything, they have Team Spirit. We know that very well. So. They do, and they have a, a great lineup as they're playing from the uh, the Chesify headquarters oh, there. Oh, we have uh, the one and only Mr. Hikaru in the, in the chat. chat. With white is better, excuse moi. I'm sure that's exactly how he said it. He um, said, ex I'm sure he says excuse moi. I didn't say white was better. I said white's the only one who can win. That's what I said, right? <laughs> yes, Don't put yes, words in my no, mouth. Or, yes, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I stand by that because the D5 pawn is the only real target, uh, which is on a light square. Okay, now, now black is probably blundering. So if you play rook a1, white can play a4. Or actually, no. If you play rook a1, you can just take d5 because you've got a fork on e7 at the end of the line. Right. So, in fact, that's exactly what Dubrov did, and I think that uh, I think he will it's be better. It's almost as you as if you called the pawn it's on almost, d5 being as, weak. As if I called it. I did call yeah. that white would be better and win this game. White's right, the only and... one who could win. I didn't mean that you wouldn't have defended the position, Hikaru. All right. Um, what other games are going on between this crosstown matchup? From... <laughs> What's that? What's funny? Uh... Um, well, let's, this is a, <laughs> let's check out this one here. Super interesting game. Yeah. We have um, a queen versus two minor piece imbalance. I assume Hikaru uh, oh, which is... Which game are you taking? Yeah, Hikaru was just making some jokes in chat. Uh, but don't worry about it. Stay strong, Danny. Let's go to the next uh, game. Uh, Danny gets proven right because of blunders all the time, buddy. There you go. All that um, matters is the, the being proven right part. All right, no, but this is interesting because... I like I like this one. It shows an evaluation of white being significantly better because of the queen, mm -hmm. you know, material value as far as how the chess engines think about it. But if you actually look at this one on the board, the reason I wanted to go to it, Hikaru yep. will remember my inability to beat his older brother um, for a national championship title in a queen versus two minor position. So that'll give him chance to get revenge against me. Uh, oh. But this is uh, this is a game that's actually kind of. Uh, similar in the sense that despite what the engine says, this is instructive for all of you watching, black is completely fine here. White has no targets. The best mm -hmm. hope is that black, uh, or sorry, that white finds a way to get a king to e8 and gangs up on the f7 pawn, which is just not a reality as long as black doesn't blunder. Right. Yeah. And it's actually... And I, and I like... mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I like what you're doing here in endgames. I think it's uh, very instructive to try to figure out where would your pieces need to be, what's the, ideal po what's the ideal position for them, and figure out if you would be winning if you could place your pieces anywhere on the board. Right. And it's really hard to do that as white here, which is how you can evaluate whether... And again, that's why you look yeah. at the engine, don't be fooled, and it's instructive to understand that we've been... It's sort of become a theme of the day. We're talking about who's got more activity, but who actually has targets. Here, white has material advantage, Dr. Evil quotation fingers, but no targets to speak of, and in fact... If anybody, okay, it's hard to say if anybody's better, it's black. Of course, that's not true. But just to point out, like, if white plays a move like g4, then mm -hmm. th then you would even have a, a square like f4 for the pieces. And and black just has no risk chess here with, with uh, no targets. Although, okay, now oh. f4's oh. happened. This is this is a blunder. Looks this like doesn't black, look good. Yeah, black has blundered away the g5 pawn and will go on to lose. So now I'm wrong. Uh, the uh, <laughs> But also because of a blunder. You're right because of blunders. But al wrong. also blunder because of a blunder. So it evens out. Okay. Black missed white's threat here. As soon as soon If you look at the analysis board, everybody, white put the queen on the g file specifically for these discovered threats. The idea was that, uh, as you saw in the game, if black does something, anything random, the, idea, the threat is f4 and you can't take because of the discovered check. So... Black just missed that this idea was coming and allowed the trick of F4 to happen. Uh, mm. Hilariously enough, no, no, this is going to be good for white because now G5 is coming and F7 falls. Okay, I was going to say yeah. maybe this is still tricky for white, but it looks like white should get the victory now. Yeah, uh, that's a, a pretty pretty great um, turnaround for the Moscow Phoenixes. Yeah, they that, really they, need you said they, they needed get, it. So, yeah. You said they needed it, and you were right. Uh, uh, look, yeah. Vlad Dubrov will be taking down um, uh, Mikhailovsky. Now now uh, both winning as black. Uh, oh, wait, what? 
No, wait. Not winning is like, no, no. Mikhailovsky no, this... is holding his own. He actually managed to get the Rook active. Oh, okay. Let me check that game as well. And in fact, uh, there we wait, go. am okay. I seeing the position from the wrong angle again? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I felt. Uh, so I thought white would be, uh, would be the one, only one in control, which I guess is still kind of happening if you look at the clock, but I feel like black did get some counterplay with this past a pawn. Right. Um, um and so how has Mikolovsky been under time pressure? We saw in the first game yeah. when he was in a tough position that he, he didn't play completely accurately here. He has a better position than he did. It's not as complicated. So, uh, let's, let's make sure. Okay. Well, I realized, uh, what I mis evaluated when I first came white was still better. And it's because I just didn't recognize that he had this past age pawn coming. In fact, yeah, if we go yeah. back to where we left, what ultimately happened was white white won the age pawn, which created oh, okay. a three on two. Right, right. Um, okay, yeah, so it seems like white is just winning here. Yeah. And, okay. and now now the uh, the queen is on the board, and it should be yep. over. Yeah, so uh, the Moscow was... So uh, their their fourth board has been having a tough time so far. Um, hopefully he can, he can score at least one point in the match. That would help a lot. It, it would help. Um, yeah. Although the Phoenix did did get a point on the game we were following with the uh, with the queen imbalance versus the right. two minor pieces. So, right. so that was helpful for them. Okay. Okay, and where to go? There's a lot. We are now in full swing. I'm gonna go back to this Dubrov game just so we can see somebody lose on time because I gotta get. I don't know. Gotta for get sure. my fix. Uh, I haven't had sure. a. I haven't had somebody lose on time in a couple minutes, so I just gotta no, get no my. No, no worries. We all need the adrenaline kick here. There we go. Here you go. Got it. Time. Hey, now everyone feels better. We've had Perfect. someone lose on time. It is online chess after all. It is. Um, I, I like hearing people in chat who said they haven't played chess since they were a kid, and that they're enjoying this. So it's always fun to have people coming back, getting interested in the game, seeing these talented rapid players win. Absolutely, and you just saw the full league standings there, a quick snapshot. You can see, of course, what we're covering is the Eastern Division. If you do happen to be just getting here, as you said, we have about 2,500 of you with us. Thank you for being here. This is the 2019 Pro Chess League. Uh, this is day two of week one. The matches are split up because it is a very global league. And, mm -hmm. um, and there you have it. A reminder that that sort of flashing... Uh, logo series above my head here is uh, sponsors of our different teams uh, throughout the season. That may that that list of sponsors may even grow. But, wow, uh, that's good news. Yeah, I, I, in fact, I think it will. But uh, the these sponsors provide everything from financial support to great locations, and I've seen some of the spreads that some of these sponsors set up. Like teams show up, and there's like food, and they cater it. And there's all kinds of amazing stuff for the player. I'm like, man, I want to play for one of these teams. Um, same, that could just be because I'm same. hungry. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think that's a nice aspiration for everybody to try to one day make it onto a pro chess league team. Right. Um, so, chat, we believe, you know, keep We keep believe going. in you. We believe in you. <laughs> exactly. And, and exactly. shout out to everyone watching us. There's uh, BJH. As we said, Coffee and Tea have been here for a while. Yeah. Uh, the commissioner, Greg Shahadi, in the Twitch Master chat. Mod. Uh, Diamond member Gianna says, great commentary in the Chess TV chat. Thanks for being here. And uh, we are following everybody as much right. as possible. Um, All right. So we got Nihal Sarin's game on the board here. Yep. Uh, he, he's now on the slightly worse side of things. Um, that, let's see. And uh, I'm going to try to pull it up to the analysis board as mm -hmm. well. We right. Go. So... It seems like he's slightly worse because uh, he has to be more defensive here. The Black a pawn is, is under fire. Them. Yeah, the a pawn is in trouble. Um, so he might just have to bring his queen back to a1 here or take on b5 if he thinks that that line is going to work out for him. Let's see. Yeah, the biggest issue is... I guess he can just take on b5. He can take on b5 and a and a2 will fall, so just a, a trade. I think that one of the biggest issues is is actually that even though it doesn't seem to be a storyline on the board right now, is that white's king, and in fact this isolated h pawn, mm -hmm. they're, they're actually a potential problem, is, is, especially if the queen and knight duo remains. Whenever you've got a right. knight versus a bishop on one side of the board, the knight can can do all these little things like maneuver itself around, eventually find a square that targets a weakness like h4, 
Mm -hmm. And the bishop, the bishop is just so much, so much more useless when the pieces are on one side of the board, right? The bishop wants to be right. helping and targeting in the in the long range. So, again, it, it's not a huge obvious thing right now because we're focused over here. But let's say even the queen side clears off, mm -hmm. and black brings the queen back to e7. You maneuver the knight. There's some, there's some. And in fact, that's why maybe uh, Sauron has played h4 because maybe he'll try to punch h5 in here at some point and get rid of that weakness he has. Uh, right. Which might also try to open up the Black King. In fact, if Queen takes a2, I expect White to play h5. In fact, we've seen Queen takes a2, so we'll see if I'm right. I think h5 is is what White needs to do to get rid of that weakness and uh, and be actually just fine in this endgame as long as that pawn comes off. Got it. So I, I like what you're doing here. Once again, the way you're evaluating the endgame is you're thinking in the in the long term, what would either side need to do to be in a better position? Um, Okay. Oh, interesting. E4. Um, We're reading all the chats, Rasta J, which is fun for you because you're on the verge of getting muted, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but the queen comes to D2. Um, uh, for people and, asking uh, how old Saren is, he's 14, you guys. What, he's a child he, prodigy. He is 14. And I'm surprised yeah. he didn't play H5, actually. If, if black gets H5 and this pawn is stuck, that's that's gonna give that's gonna give black long term chances here, but I guess he has more. No, I, I was surprised as well because I'm I'm not totally confident with yeah. uh, black's pawn. Okay, he he finally played it, but now he plays it. No, I think white should be fine now. Is if you can take on g six and open up avenues of perpetual check as well. But look at Sarn. He's, he's. I am. A, are you not worried at all about queen takes b three? Um... I am, and now and now I'm thinking that the past h pawn is as ugly as it is, is uh is actually also an issue for white because my my suggestion of playing it earlier was was a lot cleaner based on the fact that yeah. if black took it you could trade and if you, even if you ultimately lost the b3 pawn you've created so many opening uh things against the black king i think white should be should have a perpetual there but now now i'm not so sure yeah um okay so he, he took on b3 White can take back on a5 or on e okay, so he took back on a5. He played faster than I could even say anything. Um, but here comes so h4 with the threat of h3 check, and now the king yeah, is overwhelmed guarding both the h pawn and the bishop. Exactly, and he's gonna have to play against the queen and the knight, which is a lot more tricky, as you pointed out earlier. Yep. Um, so White is gonna have to go into the defensive, and I also don't like the fact that Black's king is uh, defending his bishop. So if he's distracted, yep. he loses the bishop. But if he moves the bishop away, then his king is weaker. So well, not only that, the bishop can't yeah. move right now, probably because of because of e4. I actually think that Sauron has really let this one go. Maybe he didn't recognize how potentially worse he was when we were talking about kind of the big picture of this weakness on h4. Yeah, I think he should have played h5 earlier, and he may. He may regret it for the dynamite yeah, here. So I agree. Um, I think White's only chance here is to try to see if he has any creative counterplay ideas. Um, not none are obvious. <laughs> none are obvious, and yeah. and there's not even a clear way to open up Black's King. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this one. There's a whole a bunch of games also now just getting underway again. Okay. Um, uh, if you if anybody spies with their little eye some sort of interesting position to go to. That yeah, sounded, do let us know sounded... in the chat. And if uh, you guys also want to watch the games live on chess.com so that you could be switching between them, you can. Um, they're they're all live. You guys can play between them and let us know. That's right. And again, that's a good point because it may it may be maybe something that uh, becomes useful for you, especially as it's hard for us to cover more than one game at a time when there's and right now I believe we have all 16 games in action as I look. So a whole bunch of games right. underway. And Sauron is in trouble here. There's an immediate threat, everybody, on the board. Queen takes f3 check. After king uh, takes, you get a new queen on h1. Um, so Sauron has to retreat the queen to deal with that. And I think black will probably just take back on e6 now. Don't let Eddie the eagle get, get too out of control. No, no. And maybe Sauron can finally... Maybe Sauron is holding just in time. Because if f takes e6, the queen slides to h1. And even a move like knight takes e4 with check can be met by king takes h2... And with everything becoming open, despite, okay, you can't take f2 because queen g2 check. But the point is, if everything becomes open, I actually think that white will have better drawing chances, even if he's down a couple pawns. Right. Um, um, yeah, even if, if white is down one pawn here, he still has decent the ability to hold the position. Yeah. This is I mean, not, not easily, but. Yeah. Actually, after knight takes e4, king g2, what's the next move? Is it knight g5 or knight d2 to threaten queen takes f3 with check? Something or, like knight g5. 
Or just take the pawn on e6. Oh, no, sorry, he can't. The, knight, the knight's hanging, right? Yeah, yeah. No, but you're right. You could take with the queen. That's also not a bad idea. Because um, if you take with the queen, I can't take on e4. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think black will still be the only one who can win this game, whether it's enough uh, to come up with the full point or not. Ooh, wow. king f4. King well, of four. Did you take f7? That you see every day when queens are on the board. That, that's that's what strong grandmasters do right there. I'm looking at it now and realizing, like, if white's going to hold this, he needed to just go into the fray with the king and recognize I, I can't be afraid of checks because I'm worse anyway. Right, um, right. I think, that, I think that that was a really nice idea. Just don't blunder right now with the move king g2. King yeah. g2, speaking of Alexander's reference to the searching for Bobby Fischer... We'd have knight Thank takes you. knight takes f3 and then queen c6 check. Skewering. Exactly. exactly. Skewering. Uh, I think we have a skewer emote. Classic tactic. Do I'm sure you I'm sure we do. Um, we have a skewer. Where is it? There's the skewer emote. I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and for the, for those of you asking, so it's if you do want to see the games, it's in live events, and you could uh, change the time control to rapid, and all the games you see with 15 minutes and two second increment with mastered with titled players, those are the games you can watch. Uh, I just shared it's my hey, it's my 13th anniversary today. Oh, yeah! Congratulations! Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you and Chess.com have had a longer relationship. We've had a, we've had a very long relationship, <laughs> almost okay. too long. Um, oh, but uh, the uh, the thirteenth anniversary is today. Um, all wow. right, Sarin, Sarin is actually playing brilliantly here. This idea of bringing the king in, into danger, okay, it's going to be tricky to hold. But it now is. now all he's trying to do is get the queens off the board, and I think he can even right. get away with something as crazy as queen h five. Queen f4 check, king f3, knight g5, king g2, and as scary as all this looks. Yeah, it does look scary. He has to, I mean, if it was, you know, anybody playing this on chess.com in time pressure, you'd want to try not to get mated. And he right. is actually in time pressure, but he's uh, he's an incredible player. He'll figure it out, try to trade, like you mentioned. Queen to oh. d1. Also, also good enough, I think. Yeah, he's just yeah. keeping the bishop protected so that if he gets in any checks, his king can safely move away and he has nothing yep. to worry about. So that makes sense. Yeah, no, but this is the point is a lot of times you can lose end games like this by by doing the 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 safe thing. You don't want to bring your king into a position where it's about to be checked from all over the board, right? I mean, it's scary yeah. and we're human beings and we don't like that, but it's instructive I think to see that and, and when you're already worse, just a mindset shift has to happen, which is you're fine with a draw anyway and you you'll see strong players willingly bring their king into danger in positions because they know that as much as this feels more comfortable to back up the king if you're looking at the analysis board mm -hmm. now now when i end up losing this pawn let's say straight up now i'm now i'm just down a pawn and i'm still under attack so as counterintuitive as it was to bring my king out it actually was the right thing to do because at the very least you're not down material here and i think while while as what you said is true alexander under time pressure this is still going to be very tricky to hold for white he absolutely has played the best defense and and i think that's uh Interesting to see how that happened. Yeah, right. I, I agree with that. We've, um, had, we've had so many other games. Let's just check in. Uh, Bador yeah. Jababa we'll drew... We'll check in on the standings as well to see how the teams yeah. are doing. Um, but Bador Jababa just drew his second game against okay. Mr. Grover for the Delhi Dynamite. So there's right. that. Um, uh, Ladva, Ladva actually fell again, uh, this time to Swami Nathan, I think. Unless I have the board wrong again. LOL. <laughs> LOL. I did have the board wrong. Ladva won. Just kidding. Ladva no won. You caught it before anybody else did, so it doesn't count. Yeah, nobody's watching this. So. <laughs> Nobody at all. Nobody's um, watching. Yeah, the, the, so the Moscow Wizard, Wizards still have a pretty big lead. Five and a half to two and a half. Yep. Um, Vol Volga Storm Stormbringer is still 5-3. And the, the other two teams, Estonia Horses, Mumbai Movers, and the Tbilisi Gentlemen and Delhi Dynamite are the ones that are a little bit closer in this matchup so far. Yep. So we can see the live position is still in the Nihal Sarin game and keep watching that because he's under time pressure. I'm searching for something else to look for here that's that's exciting and interesting. Okay. Um, the match that's furthest along has just started their their uh, last round of play, which is the Stormbringers versus the Armenian Eagles. Yeah, uh, let's see if the Armenian Eagles can uh, catch up a little bit here. Well, we just had another result. Let's check on the game with Puranik versus... Uh, Mr. Kook here for the Estonia horses. Okay. Uh, 
Pernick did get a win for the Movers, helping them level things up just now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to bring it to three and a half games apiece, I believe. Um, wow, and a whole bunch of games getting done. As we said, uh, Ladva won. We also have uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Kanapan, Kanapan, Priya Darshan Kanapan did get a win okay. for the Dynamite. Uh, Mr. Elvis Drew Sadwani. So a lot well, of a lot of results coming in quickly here. Hard also, for us to keep it up with looks every game. like um, Grandmaster Andreasian for the Eagles is in a little bit of trouble against the Stormbringers. Yeah, let's uh, check that out. That, that makes me a little bit nervous for the Armenian Eagles. Oh, I'm just okay. going to keep drinking out of their mug and uh, hope I'm sending them good wishes. <laughs> Hopefully you're sending them good vibes. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. the, uh, let's see, is he, is he in trouble though? Or was it just a dream, right? Is well, it just I, a, I, I now, now there's Knight takes E5. That's actually, so, okay, I, I didn't see Knight takes E5 yet, but I was a little bit nervous for White because of his king placement, the doubled pawns, and the fact that Black yep. has his rook on the second uh, rank here. No, and, and I don't think you're wrong. I think mm. uh, I think that after Knight takes E5, Black just takes on B2, and if anything, White is the one fighting for a draw, it looks like, versus the uh, the young... The young... I don't even know... Dangerous. I want to come up with a nickname. I want to call uh. him, like, Abby G or something. <laughs> It sounds like know. a young rapper. N Nihal Sauron did indeed hold the draw there, uh, so good for him. Okay, defending that nice really, really done. tough position as white. Yeah, yeah. That was a very impressive endgame. Um, he, he plays knight g6, so he's got a fun threat here if you're Andreasian. After rook takes b3, you'd have to deal with rook f5, and, uh, and that's a real problem on f8. Mm -hmm. So instead, uh, black plays the move king f7 to make sure he doesn't get mated. Abdus Satorov yeah. isn't going to fall for that. He's going to get the king active and remind right. Andreasian that he's still better. And this is a good example of where the as long as there's no mating net theme on the board with the rook mm -hmm. and knight, then the bishop should be better than the knight in this endgame, I think. Right. Um, um, but also, I haven't seen Andreasian in uh, having less time than his opponent so far. If you remember, he had the crushing attack earlier. He's always been pretty pretty confident with his time. So that's that was another thing that had me a little worried for him. Steffi 9-4. I don't think the Stormbringers were ever actually behind in this match. It was tied 2-2 no. after the first game, the first set of play, excuse me. Um, and then they, they took the lead there, and um, they will uh, have to really fight back here in the last round of play because it looks like yeah. the Stormbringers will be holding. And last year, the Stormbringers got sixth place in the Eastern Division. The Armenian Eagles won it. So for the for the Stormbringers to have such a, a good result so far is a great sign for them this, this yep. season. Okay, so B5 is played now. Um, Abdus Satorov is, is going to be pushing here. Will it be enough? He's, he's up a clear pawn, right, if we're just doing the math. Five mm -hmm. pawns for black, four for white. Yep. I don't think his king is in danger of getting mated anymore. But mm -hmm. where's, the, where's the beef beyond that? One of the funny risks of playing the D pawn, which is your extra pass pawn. Okay, first of all, you may not be able to do that. Uh, Andre Austin's probably going to hold that d5 square. But even if you push it, you take away the defense of your bishop, which could could become sort of weird tactically. I think that you should be careful and under time pressure not to get in trouble because the rook and knight can be really tricky. Right, right. Um... Look at this move knight f4, actually, because if the king backs up, there's king f5 for white, and maybe suddenly Andre Austin is turning this around. Look at white getting some some unexpected counterplay maybe with the with the active king. Right, so I, it looks like what Black is trying to do to counter that is activate his king as well. In case, if anything, like rook d5, he can play king e4. Um, yeah, his king definitely wants to go towards the center here, so he is doing that at least here. And he's also supporting the, the past d pawn, so we'll see. But but it's it's risky. He had to play he had to play king e5 to stop the king entry, and now after rook yeah. f3, there's an obvious threat. Knight d3 yeah. would be a fork emote. That's true. I don't disagree that it's risky for Black. Um, Tricky. He's got to uh, got to figure out how to deal with this fork threat. Maybe even just a simple rook move, I guess. Something like rook b1. Yeah. Then you're not afraid of the check because your king is getting active. Right. Um, so what White is trying to do here is if, if Black Kings gets, King gets too far from the jeep on, then that becomes a weakness for him as well. Whoa. Uh, we got to check on something. Oh, please. Huge upset for the Eagles. 
Unfortunately, we didn't catch the final moments as the Rook did move to avoid the fork. Let's go check on what happened and why uh, Dimitri Andraken, the top board for the Stormbringers, just fell to uh, wow. Materiacion. Um, let's, uh, let's see what happened here in the final moments. The Black King came rushing up the board. This was a wild one. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see it, but if you're following the analysis board, looks like white was up the exchange. Oops. That game okay, just I'm, disappeared. I'm, gonna fo I'm following the uh, analysis board on here since I didn't have it open. Uh, I got to uh, I gotta bring, bring it back up. Okay. Because uh, the next game started, took me away. But yeah. Yeah. Th the exchange sack by white... I guess worked out because Black's King was just in big trouble. Uh, sorry, the, White was up the exchange. Black okay. didn't get enough for an attack. And uh, this this fun move, Knight takes F3 on the analysis board, threatened Bishop to H2 check and winning the Queen on B7. But mm -hmm. White plays the nice and subtle King H1. This is one of the more interesting games we've seen. Okay. G4 is going for mate, but look at White here. Just uh, laughing in the face of danger. Just takes the extra piece just, on C7. He's a pawn grabber. He's just going for it yeah. here. Queen h4, knight mm -hmm. h2, and Andraken just doesn't have enough. The king rushes up the board trying to avoid checkmate, but is unable to do so. And uh, very nice, nice little cute little finish there. Queen takes g3. Of course, if black had taken, we'd have a fork on f1. So, all right, well, a huge win there uh, for yeah. username Mickey Tari on there um, versus Dimitri Andraken. And the Eagles have brought this thing one game closer. Okay, well, I'm I'm glad to hear that. Obviously, it's always more fun to have close games, regardless who you're cheering for. Yeah, Artak Manukian in a uh, a very close game here. Okay. Um, Probably on the worst side of it. Also, looks like another okay. another French pawn structure. They're used to being worse, right? Uh, so. we we like to think of it as taking the slower road to a better end game. You there know? you go, the slower road. I love it. Um, all right, Rook C4 was played by Manukin. He's, okay. uh, he's, he's, uh, he's worse mainly, we say, just because of the space advantage White has and the potential yeah. of an attack here. But but now, yeah. okay, Rook C4 was nice because you're threatening to double Rooks on the C file and, and you're forcing White to make a decision here. Right. Although, if he does bring the Rooks onto the C file, he is taking one piece away from the defense on the king side. Uh, and what happens if just rook takes c4, pawn takes? Because at least then white is creating another weakness for black by giving mm -hmm. him an isolated pawn, both on c4 and on a7. It's a good question, because you could do it and then play rook c1. Right, and, and uh, just completely switch your focus from attacking the king to taking yep. advantage of the bad pawn structure. Yep. So, obviously, these are the kind of things that uh, Gorazanin is, is going to be thinking about. Um he, uh, this is this is probably going to be an exciting finish. We'll keep our eye on it because the fact that both sides are sort of getting under time pressure mutually, mm -hmm. Alexandra, right? This means we could have one of those bit of a topsy-turvy finish. Let's right. check back in on the other game, though. As we said, this matchup started first, and we've got the game now with uh, Abdu Satorov and Andreasian. It looks like Abdu Satorov is, is uh, just moments away from finishing the job. He made the right decision. Alexandra, you were right when he played King E5 because look at this king. It just came all the way up since we left it. Um, and uh, Ooh. King to F3, takes G3. Uh, Abdusaturov playing extremely well. And I see mate on H4. I spy with my little eye mate on H4, and I don't think this it's This is stoppable. not something you'd expect out of this type of endgame, right? Because yeah. he was up a pawn. We expected to squeeze, but to just straight up go and figure out a way to mate your yeah. opponent? Wow. And he, yeah, he just resigned. Abdusaturov is... Uh, Putting on a show wow. today, the the youngster who again is as young as he looks in that little profile picture. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, we have a we have this sort of common theme here, Alexander. If we got to go back to the analysis board, we had the game with Nihal Sarin playing this aggressive, mm -hmm. dangerous king move, laughing right. in the face of danger, and then here Abdusaturov does the same thing, brings the king up. At first sight, you're like, wait, is there mate? Nope, there's nothing here against the black king. Yes. And this, this king ended up helping Black deliver mate of his own to the point where uh, Andreasen just resigns because there's no way to stop it. So, fantastic chess there from Abdusaturov. Yeah, exactly. And when whenever you're teaching people who are just starting to study endgames, you talk about how important the king is. Well, these two endgames were 
very depictive of that. So that was yep. awesome to see. Although the last one was even more exciting. <laughs> the uh, and, and it's just interesting to see that I yeah. think as, even as commentators, we don't have an engine in front of us, so we're like, oh, right. I mean, it, we we play the safe human move. Don't put your king there. Like, what are you yeah. doing, right? But yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, again, I saw like coming with the king up, I was a little nervous. I didn't know if there was a mate or something that he might have to be wearing. Right, of. but it shows you, and it's a it's a good lesson. Like, you have to be concrete before before sort of intuitive when you can, right? You if you can calculate yeah. and you're not getting mated, the active king was the right thing to do. Right, okay, right. the uh, the Manukin exactly. game's getting exciting. Look at this. Okay, the, coming back. The knight to has found its way back over to uh, to e4, and now black plays the move f5. So he, he he didn't take the rook. Uh, he he fa he came up with another plan here. Yeah, back on rook c4, he played b3 and tried to force Manukin off the c file, but he wouldn't give in that easy. And brings the knight. I actually like where this is sort of headed from a practical point of view. Mm -hmm. Manukin is trying to play f5 and f4 before it's too late in terms of time pressure. I think right. objectively, it objectively this can't be good for black. F5 sort no. of self traps the queen. If this knight moves and then we just go back to gobbling pawns, I on a7. Yeah. yeah, I mean he has to actually have some type of sound. But 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 Manukin is a very good practice. Like look at the time situation, right? What he sensed yeah. there was was that Gorazanin was getting under time pressure. He was, he was, you know, maybe, maybe not going to be prepared to now deal with an attack. And I think Manukin will play f four, probably even with the threat of something like knight takes d five coming. Just he's got to create a practical situation where Gorazan and might not be able to find the best moves under time pressure. Right, right, that makes sense. I mean, I am worried about f four here, like you mentioned, because it does seem that knight takes d five after pawn takes, queen takes, white should be winning material in that situation. Right. Rook f seven, um, e six. Yeah, but but again, I still like the overall but, idea of eventually. But if knight takes d five, maybe then you take g three. Yeah, and then, I mean he's gonna have to calculate here, and he. I want something like rook takes f three and queen f five check, and okay, I'm obviously. Okay, you want the craziness, but I, you, I always you want the craziness. When we're you're observing right, you're right. Rather than you hey, feel the pressure. You know what? I gotta go for something. The uh, the, but the point no, and I think objectively, sh surely white must be better here, but. Um, Look, right. And here it comes, right? I mean, he plays G5. G5? He this has is... no fear. Okay. Last game of the year, Dan. Can't hold anything back now, right? That's true. Uh, I mean, the it's, Eagles... It's actually the, it's actually the first Eagles game on. of the year. First week of the year. But True. You know. Um, but they always fight like it's the most important game. Yeah, shout out to uh, Greg Shahadi's last comment in the chat. And whoa, we had a big uh, big amount of bits come in there from Cash Mank. Thank you so much. Aw, um, the, thanks, uh, Cash Mank. And uh, but Greg Shahadi said that Maxime Bache Legrave will actually be streaming his own commentary while playing, similar to what Grandmaster Hikaru Nakamura did. I uh, heard. I, I love how the Pro Chess League is bringing these top players, is bringing streaming to the attention of these top right. players, and some of them are actually starting to do it themselves. So this is awesome. Uh, what is his Twitch account? That's a good question. If anybody knows and they can share in the chat, please do. Wow. Knight takes d5 comes. This is going to be right where we Ooh, stick right here. He just took. Okay. He yeah, just we're, takes we're on not d5. Um, we, and you, this you is, did this point is, this out earlier on, so let's see if it actually works out. It looks out. good for white. I mean, yeah. yeah, rook f7 would have been met by e6. Yep. So again, I mean, I think objectively we were saying all along, I mean, white is white is winning here, yeah. and it looks like Gorazanin is doing what he, what he should do, find the right moves under time pressure, but... Um, but Manukin is is kind of all in on the chance that he might get some sort of winning tactic. But right, knight right. h four was a very good accurate move. The point was the queen can't just move anywhere without the knight hanging. Right. Um, F three king g one. Wait a second. Uh, queen takes g three. I was just gonna say, wait a second. There's a tactic with F two check. And this if, is if king some F1, tactical prowess from our Manukin. That was awesome. What was is a blunder by White after F three check King G one was just horrible. White should have yeah. just taken right back on F three and just said, "What do you got? You've got nothing." King uh, G one, and Manukin finds a saving tactic. I think that Black might might oh be holding man, this yeah. game now. Yeah, White could have played King H two and just defended on G three, but I don't think I, this was a, not an easy thing. To oh, see. also, yeah. I mean, your move is even better than Knight takes King H two would have just been winning for White. Now knight g3. He e1 and he gets a queen. Then yep, takes e1. There, is there any mate? It doesn't look I, I think like. white has to find a way to settle on a draw. No way. 
Who what is what Manuki a turnaround and there! And what again, engine does he have installed up in here? From a practical point of view, again, Manukian. Again, this is very much Mikel Talish, right? I mean, the point is, he. Of course, this attack shouldn't have worked for Black, and all White had to do was play the move, King to and H2 in this White position. Is about everyone to get into time pressure. Is this even better for Black now? It might. Mm, okay, White has two pass pawns here, but. Black has has checks, and he can bring in his rook after to try to put some more pressure on the king. Wow, this is this just changed completely yep. here. What's funny uh, is actually, it's actually still very hard for Manukin <laughs> because yeah. despite all that, if this this knight does such a good job of defending the king, moves like rook f two, everybody king h three, and where's your next check? Right, the knight right. guards everything from the queen. So this is still a very hard position for Black, but but time pressure still favors Manukian, and that's exactly what he was doing with this sort of crazy all-in idea. So now the queens are off the board. Um, I don't know if... I guess it made sense that uh, Goro's Jane didn't want to have to worry about being too defensive here with so little time. Any mistake could just cost him the game. So he traded off. He has two pass pawns and the knight. He's instantly bringing his king to help support the pawn push here. Um, yeah, but King D5, I mean, this is the kind of game Yeah. it takes accurate play to play this position as white to hold those pawns. I think that Manukian is, is, is completely turning this game around, and and the uh, the Eagles need it. Oh, I wish we had a live feed from the Eagles right now. I would love to see well, We had the expression. picture of them earlier on social media, but yeah. Yeah, I we mean, can this just is... imagine what it looks like. Because yeah. we know how they look when they're, when they're winning big games, right? We saw it last year at the live finals, and... Uh, yeah. Wow, what a crazy turnaround. Just a huge blunder from White playing the move King to G1. Um, right. That was not the right move. I do not know why Manukin didn't just play King D5 first. The, now that the White King will get to E3, he'll actually get Knight F4 check, and the two right. pass pawns will become a reality. That, that was The Rook was right where it needed to be, blocking the Knight. Because oh, variations like King D5, Knight F4 check, you don't have to take D4 and allow the fork. You can play King E4. Right and hit the knight and I and instead now, if white gets king e three the knight will or king e four now now the pawns are getting loose I, I don't know what's going on here anymore. Right. Well, I, I mean, it seems like Artok is is taking hit. He's just pushing the pawns as well. It's yeah. He's just he going to push the h pawn and hope that that's um, enough. But here hope comes that the it's faster pawn. than him. And he doesn't even have time to calculate it out. I mean, he has ten seconds. Uh, yeah. Actually, ooh. though, that was uh. Can you push? H or what if knight takes? Oh, I think he thought no. he was going to take with the king. I think he thought he was going to take with the king. H3 takes. He's going to win the d-pawn. Yeah. He's, sorry, he's going to win the e-pawn. No, he can't take it? Why couldn't he take it? He could have. I think he was afraid of d7. Which ah, d7. In fact, let's show it on the board. After yeah, takes, let's, let's take after takes e5, d7, rook to d1, you have d8 queen, rook takes, <sighs> and then knight f7 check, forking the king and rook. Man. Now Black yeah, everybody... is Black was still drawing that, but Well Okay, Manukin has taken the right approach, the, it looks the like. The live board now looks like Manukin is Yeah, I think Manukin found the right approach about... there. Oh my gosh, he's about to win that the pawn on D six because White is forced to move the knight away, and once he what does it's an amazing win. comeback. Are I mean let's kidding? let's reflect on that. Yeah, our talk just won. We'll keep oh the analysis board on, on the table here, because this was about as exciting a turnaround as possible. Again, if you're just joining us, Manukin here, completely losing in this position as black. Plays f3 check, pretty much out of desperation. Uh, knight takes f3, of course, is easily winning for white, but king h2 is just lights out. Now the queen has no squares it can move to to guard the knight. Like, literally, it's over. The queen moves anywhere, we trade. Yeah. And, and king h2 would have been resigned times for black, but white blunders with king g1, and Manukin crashes through with the brilliant queen takes g3, f2 check, knight that was takes g3. A beautiful tactic. I mean, um, and white white should have still been drawing here. Probably there was some sort of perpetual check, um, or even even knight takes f8 instead of what he did. Uh, was better, probably right. this, this would have been a draw, but but instead, uh, um, Gorazanin does not figure out the right approach under time pressure. Amazing stuff. Yeah. Um, and somebody had an interesting comment in the chat, and I like it because it, it makes sense to be curious about this for tournaments. He was asking um, are, if players are streaming, what if they're reading their chat? Is it an issue? Like just in terms of playing online chess and also streaming it. Well, 
first of all, these players are better than anybody in their chat. We don't have to say that twice. But also, chess.com has anti-cheating technology, so it's incredible that now we're able to have fair tournaments that are online. I think this is going to be a big game changer for online chess. Uh, agreed, agreed completely. And uh, there's also, you know, we're, we're considering what other esport events have done in regards to whether there is a need for a stream delay uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to increase. There's already a stream right. delay so that by the time the viewers are seeing it, it's it's usually not exactly lived up with what's in the chess.com's live server, but uh, there may be increased stream delays as we go on. And the truth is that with so many teams and players putting themselves on camera, put it this way, if MVL mm -hmm. was reading something in chat and then he used it to his advantage, that whole thing has been recorded. And, yeah. it's, and it's on Twitch. And it's, again, not something I believe that uh, we need to worry about. Um, but, right. you know... The the main thing I think that people wonder about cheat technology is how do you how do you detect, uh, you know when when someone's using things in spots and again I can't get into all of our stuff. Wait, did White just blunder after right. Queenie two check? No, there's Queenie three. Okay, I'm looking at. Uh, <laughs> I know you're uh, you're explaining and looking. Yeah, but not an easy thing to do. but you know and that's that's um that's something that we work really hard on all the time mm -hmm. and obviously uh, that's our goal and for those of you who followed the Pro Chess League closely over the last couple of years then you know that. We actually have closed numerous title players for cheating, and we will continue to do everything we can. So um, we have the technology, and we're not afraid to use it, if that's what you're wondering. so. Oh, that sounds um, scary. <laughs> the, uh, no, but it's important, and I think that we don't make a big public stink about it for a number of reasons. Right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's, um, there's a lot being done about that. So. Yeah. The... Uh, all right, where to go here? We've had another game in the books. The uh, Wizards are continuing to show their dominance, pretty much led by Vladimir Dubrov, uh, as he just he just took down yet another Phoenix player. Oh my uh, gosh, I don't think the the F Moscow Phoenix Six can come back from this anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the deficit is getting bigger, so we'll just leave yeah. that out. Um, the live position continues to follow this game here between Savchenko, uh, but this is their game they need, right? Yeah, uh, Kriakvin. Kriakvin, if he gets this win as White, then they they are they are still alive. And right now, White is probably the only one who can win this Queen and Pawn ending. I like what Subchenko's doing though. Um, if I go back to it here, I will I will go back to it. Okay. Um, I was just on it, and now I just have to find it because there's a lot of games going on here. For sure. Uh, you're 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 looking at the position between Subchenko and Yep. Kriakvin. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, ooh, the, uh, something weird just happened. I guess it's not that weird. E5 just looks like a crazy move because uh, it, lo it looks like he's giving up the pawn. So I think this is a fun thing to look at here. Well, and I think Bla Black is, is doing what you would want to do in an endgame like this where your only chance is to get a perpetual check with the queen, right? Yeah. If you look at it, you're, you're down already. Uh, might as well be two pawns because the king side is locked up and the C pawn is about to queen. Right. So your only chance is to create chaos. from And from that perspective, E5 is trying to just open up more lines rather than leave yet another file closed. You're just trying to get rid of that pawn and create new avenues to get a perpetual check. So, Right. I, I like it. It goes very well with the saying, desperate times call for desperate measures, yeah. and that often plays out in these kinds of positions. Well, we just saw Manukian do it, right? Exactly. I mean, that was literally, I could almost see it happening. I was like, Black is completely lost here. Got but it. under time pressure, you could see that Manukian knew that it was his only chance, and I, and I think that that's that's something that we have to remember. It's the professional rapid online chess league, which means that players will get under time pressure, and the best move is one thing, finding it is another. Right, um, right. And even these top players, just it, it's impossible to play perfectly when you get yep. into time pressure. And I, 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 just, I remember you have the eval uh, on the side of the board, so chat can see just how crazy it right. is even when at a game, When a game turns around like that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you're ever analyzing your own games and stuff like that happens, don't feel too bad. <laughs> this is this is a big moment here because White is going to – I was going to say, is he going to yeah. take with the queen rather than the pawn? Taking with the pawn would have given Black a past H pawn. And suddenly, the whole game could turn around. So yeah, and unfortunately for Black here, once he plays king c7, the two pawns are – blocking any chances black has for perpetual so i yeah i guess he might as well take the pawn but no way to force a draw here the the c pawn is going to be pushed and with the queen and king here he should be able to support the pawn all the way to promoting 
Kriakvin has done a great job of just limiting the opportunity of that black queen getting getting diagonals yeah. for perpetual check. I mean, yep. this is an open board with a white king on c7. You would think that there's a check, but there is none, right? And so Kriakvin gets a ton of credit for showing us good technique, limiting your opponent's counterplay, uh, keeping the miserable miserable. That's how you convert these endgames. Oh, man. That that was a, that was a harsh one. <laughs> harsh one, but that's that's what it is, right? You, you that's know, the to, truth. To... Yeah, chess is a rough game. It's brutal. Chess Ooh. is a rough game. Queen takes before. Yeah, it is. I, I can't disagree here. So obviously, no trades here. Um, it's the most obvious move, the move that makes the most sense. Just continuing to push the pass pawn. Okay, yep. seems like it is. White will. The main thing is White's queening with check, right? So even a yep. trade on f four. And something like h4 is just too slow. And in fact, yep. not only did we predict that the Phoenix would have a hard time coming back, but now that it's officially over, the uh, the Moscow Wizards have clinched this one oh, before the last half. round even begins. Um, the uh, Regardless of what happens in this game, Sevchenko looks like he is going to go down, so that'll be a win for the Phoenix. But uh, the Wizards have already clinched the match victory today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Remember, everybody, though, if we remind you how the league point system and standings work this year is that right. the overall score you have in the match <clears throat> excuse me, really, really matters. And that's because it is not just a 1 and 0 if you lose a match, right? It's your total points for the match. So losing a match, you know, 12 to 4 is a lot worse than losing a match 9 to 7 because in the end, the total points you earn throughout the season are what decides the playoff standings and the playoff seating. So uh, right. that's a quick... Quick reminder you see on screen of the overall format, but um, the uh, the scoring yeah. system is something that is, you, if you follow the standings, go to ProChessLeague.com. You will see the teams are ranked based on the total points they have, not just whether they won or lost the match. Right, right. Um, yeah, they, they do get bonus points, 10 points for winning the match. Yes. But on top of that, it also is very important to score as many points as you can, even if you're losing. So... I, I would say it is harder to do when you already know you've lost the match. You have a little bit of a losing mentality here. Yep. But hopefully the Moscow Phoenixes are in it for the long run. And hey, don't stop fighting, guys. But Well, uh, this is their first match. This is their Pro Chess League debut, as long with their crosstown rival, the Wizards. And so they are going down. But as you said, they got to keep fighting. And Savchenko falls here, helping the Phoenix fight just a little bit. Yeah. Let's go to this game here um, from the... Estonia horses versus the Mumbai movers. We have Canip versus Swaminathan. Paul, Paul sixes. Six, Paul the sixty. Paul and the sixes. Perfect. Paul He's with the sixty. Because there's nope. so many numbers. Amazing. So this, this game looks exciting. Paul with the sixty has just played knight takes e6 Ooh. check, and black is up a piece, but may not uh, may not have enough to defend the mating net. I figured this might be the most exciting is, one to follow here down the stretch. This is a very exciting position to look at. Um, so what does Black do here? I think that uh, White's attack is just crushing, actually. Kind of kind of right. hard to stop. Let's see. Um... I, uh, yeah. I see I see a message in chat that we just had a mouse slip in Nihal Sarin's game. We have to go check that out. A mouse slip? We have to check that out oh, because it's no. our first our first of the of the year that I've covered. I don't know if you and Robert had any mouse slips on uh, Tuesday. We, we but didn't have any. We didn't have any yet. The House Sarn has just lost to Jochka 007, uh, which, of course, is uh, David Jojua. Jojua? Joj I don't know. But uh, let's show this on the board here. We, yeah, uh, please do. I'm going to wait for it. We want to get Nihal Sarn's game versus Jojua. Okay. No? Okay, show it on the analysis board just so we can do it there. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a look at your analysis. The, the mouse slip is something that happens in online chess. Uh, can we bring uh, the analysis board back up? Yes, I know that all too well. And chat, hopefully you guys do as well. There we go. All right, here's the deal, guys. After bishop takes f5, Sarn is just better as white and played the move queen to g5. Look at that. I, I'm going to catch it soon. I'm, I have a bit of a delay to see the analysis board. You know, it hurts to lose a game with a mouse slip, but it does happen, and it will not be the last time we see it happen in in this format. So uh, after bishop takes g5, white just resigned on the spot. I think any oh, other move no. to take the bishop, queen takes or pawn takes, oh, would have left no. Sarn better. So, All right, we'll go back That's to the game brutal. with Paul and a million sixes. The, uh, the position is still going to be super tough for black, but I think he made the right call right. to not take e6, although now... 
Yeah. Now White can just take the piece back on D6 if he, yeah. if he wants. Yeah, exactly. And whenever you have an attack that you sacrifice some type of material for and you can get your piece back and you're still in a better position, you know that things yep. are at least going your way. Um, obviously, White can see if there's any better ideas. Um, maybe taking on D5 first, but in the very in the very worst case, can just take the bishop back. Yep. And Queen takes Black G7, seven, also an option just to gain a tempo True. on the rook. Hard okay, to, he, hard he to just, see. He just took the piece. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Move the knight to safety, maybe even take G7 along the way, and white is just in the uh, in the hunt here for a win. Right. Canip is, is going to get this one. So what does that put the match at? In fact, this is kind of a big game because the yeah. Estonia horses need, Are behind. Yeah. need that victory. They're down right now. But they did just get oh, – no, wait. No, that was the Dynamite. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting that Sorin does not play for the movers. He plays for the Dynamite. That mouse slipped. Um, right. Uh, so right now it's 3.5 to 5.5 for the Estonian horse. Estonian right. horses have 3.5. So if they win this game, it's going to help them a little bit. Yep. Um, this and this be, was a pretty uh, close matchup as well. So it would be a good victory here. Okay. Um. Tree Skeleton is asking who mouse slipped. It was uh, Grandmaster Sarin. He's been playing really well today. I think this is his first loss of the day. Yeah. Yep. And a uh, so, heartbreaking one to lose that way. Um, all right. True. Well, we're gonna we'll check back in on the the Eagles and the Stormbringers here in a minute. We now have the board one, board one match, board two, board two. Right. You're in that. You're in that kind of final stage. But I wanna yep. I wanna go to some of the games that are under time pressure. Um, this one's exciting. I think Conop's gonna gonna get a victory here. So let's stay with the Estonia horses versus the movers and go to uh, Maylev 12's game okay. versus Abu Dhabi. Uh, All that right. being Grandmaster Pyrrhonic. This is a dynamic game. one. Black's king is on F7. Not sure how that happened. <laughs> um, whoops. Still opening up the games here. Looks so good many games white. going on at the same time here. Yep. Well, um, okay, got it. The, the biggest yeah. issue here is that it's not even just that uh, Black's King is on F7, but White has open lines on both sides of the board. This knight can't move because of C7 falling. I right. think if White can find a way to start working it on the light squares, uh, there's also, I guess, just on the board whether whether White should play Bishop takes G4 or not. Um, something like Bishop takes G4 would be an exchange sack on Rook takes H4, but you get Bishop takes D7. And you're right. opening up the uh, the attack versus Elvis. So this, I think Pure Nick is smartly managing his time here. David and I talked about that on Tuesday, where you get in a critical position and you just have a feel that okay, it's time to take a couple minutes and make sure I find the right approach here. Yeah, um, and it seems like they've both been managing their time pretty well. But yeah, it's even. Definitely, if White can use this moment to figure out a good plan and set himself up for the rest of the game, especially when he's in a better position, then he's actually saving time later on. So Yep. No, it's a great point, yep. Yeah. Um, and so Pure Knight goes for Bishop D3. I guess that's also a simple way to maybe be better because the Queen doesn't want to move and just lose the tempo, but Bishop F5, White will just trade and then win the G4 pawn yeah. straight up. So, so Elvis also, has to uh, make a tough decision. Yeah, thank you T3HWolf for subscribing to the Chess.com channel. Obviously, we have sponsors this year for the Pro Chess League for some of the teams, helping them, you know, get uh, where to play in spaces like that. But you guys also who are watching and subscribing to the channel help as well. So we really appreciate it here from Chess.com. Yep, thank you so much. And we've got, okay, the, the game with Paul in a million sixes is about to end. We can go back there if we're interested in seeing Checkmate on the board. Which um, we're always a little interested in. <laughs> we're always a little interested, I guess. So. Yeah, let, let's see if there's any cool tactics in this position here for how white can finish it off. So queen queen to e5 straight up threatens rook to c5, as now the queen is right. guarding both of these dark and, okay, so Yeah, just resign here. No, no, oh, no, actually lost on time, but no, no mate, oh, unfortunately. Oh, on time, true, 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 sorry. No mate. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saban there. All right, so back to the game. Uh, back to the the matchup of the movers versus the horses. Look at this game between Audibon and Ladva. All right. We've got craziness. That's what we're here for. So Audibon is up the exchange, but everything is on one side of the board. 
Okay. Yeah, he had to move his way, his king out of the way because rook f1 is coming, which might be coming regardless now because he wants to get his rook onto the open file. Um, yeah. This is probably well, objectively black should be okay. Maybe black should hold this, but with no time on the clock, you think it's going to be hard. Although these grandmasters have played a lot of games like this, and that's something I think that you know, can't be underestimated because we may look at the position and be like, how do you hold down the exchange with only 15 seconds? But they've right. they've played this scenario probably dozens of times in an online, especially in online chess, right? These guys play so yeah. much blitz and bullet and all that stuff. So, Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, I like what he's doing with queen h6. He's also trying to prepare for some potential uh, perpetual or right. just even a checkmate threat. No, not yet because the king would be able to escape on f3. Hmm. White's just well, gonna. I... White's just gonna try to create a scenario where Black can't defend under time pressure here. We've. Uh, yeah. You, know, you might. You might play G4 and then try to bring the king around and focus on the F6 pawn. But still, objectively, Black should be fine despite what the engine eval bar says there, everyone, because White is always going to be considered better with the extra material. But, oh, sorry. Oh, I was looking at a different game from you, and now I look back and see that I was being completely silly. I, okay. I was. I was wondering what you were saying, but I didn't want to call attention to it because I was like, I don't think black can checkmate white here. But anyway, hey. No, you uh, can't. I was looking at an, another another game that some of the things you were saying to were also applying until the last part. That's okay. Hey, but guess what? <laughs> I was I was wrong to say that white didn't have chances because black yeah, played this move H4. Yeah, weirdo. Sorry, I had to come back. I was very confused Let, about what was going on. <laughs> let's keep the live position on the only remaining game in in this uh, this 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 round of play here between the movers and the horses, but look at the analysis board, because this is a really instructive moment for those yes. who are here to learn, um, and not just uh, laugh laugh at us, uh, but if you're here to learn... The, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was looking at the um, Grandmaster... I was saying laugh at me, don't even worry game. about it, but... Game. There we go. H4, now you're on the game I was looking at. <laughs> H4 was unnecessary, because, again, the reason why this is, this is uh, hard for white to win is precisely because black has no real weaknesses, so... The only real way to lose endgames like this usually is to kind of try to defend it. You know, that sounds silly, right? But if you try to do something, you might lose it. If you just sit tight, you have a much better chance of holding. Or even, let's say, knight to h6. Because now when things like g4 are played, mm -hmm. white is going to give you squares. Squares like e5 and f4. And despite the extra rook, it's really hard to get, to get a target for that rook to prove it's better. But right. by playing the move h4... Uh, Ladva actually just walked right into a transition where takes, knight takes, white can just easily sacrifice the exchange back and go into a winning king upon ending. And um, David and I talked about that a lot yesterday where it's really important that you're always aware, whether you're trying to win or draw an ending, if yep. this trade happens, who's going to be better then, right? You're just constantly keeping that bigger picture in mind. Okay, I'm in, exactly. I'm in a rook ending, but can I trade into the king and pawn ending and keep my winning chances? Or I'm in an obstacle bishop ending. What happens if these pieces come off? And so um, that blunder happened by Ladva under time pressure because he just kind of just lost sight of not allowing the king and pawn ending to occur. So, all yeah. right. No, that, that's very, very nicely put. And that's... The, the I mean, it's obvious, but strong players who are really good at end games know how to transition their middle games properly. Right. And you see that a lot at higher level play. Okay, Purinic is on the attack, but with Elvis defending and White's king now on f4, I'm thinking that. Uh... So these Ooh, grandmasters Bishop and their G6. kings on f4. Wait a second. Uh oh. Queen uh -oh. h6 check is winning on the spot. It yeah. forces the queens to be yeah. traded, and then there's a skewer on the f file. Yeah, he just blundered. He was completely winning. Oh, uh -oh, my God. oh, spaghettios, and uh, that's a that's a huge win for the horses who will take uh, take one game back. They're still down in the match, yeah. but okay. I mean, we're assuming for them. assuming Elvis converts this. He is just up the exchange. Rook f three. Okay, or king f six, threatening mate. That also does the trick. Um, okay, rook f three or uh, or rook g one just to stop g five. Black should be yeah. good here. Yeah. Wow. Um... Look at this! That Look was, at this that was again. Disappointing for for White here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what, I mean. We were saying it. I was looking at the board. Yeah, objectively, White was still okay, but the King on F four, that was just like, uh, that's just blunders happen. I right. still am waiting for that bumper sticker. Blank happens. Blunders happen. You know. Although, if the two of us are commentating, it should be a bunker bumper sticker that says stalemate happens. That's, that's what it should true. Say. That's true. Yeah. So. Well, you. 
not going to comment. <laughs> a, 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 in fact, that has a dual meaning because when we say S happens, S happens, we could be referring to stalemate. S happens. Um, what else would S be referring to? I don't know. Either. Oh. I, don't, right. I don't know. Either. Okay. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, all right. Um, we're back right. to the game between Volkov and Grover. All a right. matchup that hasn't gotten a lot of love from us today. Um, admittedly so, but for whatever reason, um, the, uh, okay, got it. Um, actually let's go, let's check out a, a game from this matchup, but a slightly different one. Let's go to Lexi Sexy's game versus Priya Darshan Konopin. Fine. So I'm uh, okay, cool. Uh, that's Badur Jabava playing the black mm -hmm. pieces here. Yep. And, uh, so this match is very close. Five, five. Oh. Okay, anyway. Um, the Tbilisi gentlemen have an interesting logo, I have to say. The guy with the top hat. Yeah, it looks like it's the logo of a speakeasy or something, but that's okay. <laughs> it's it's kind of classy. <laughs> kind of classy. Don't let right. our designer know that. he des I mean, These logos are amazing, but that logo just for some reason just, I you know. Well, I speakeasies know. need nice, nice logos as well. There's nothing wrong with a designer's job there. <laughs> the... Um, <laughs> All right. Well, black is black is putting pressure here on white, and this is going to be a really tough one for uh, Canapen to hold. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, looks like yeah, I, I think we're just waiting for the move B four to come. As yeah, soon as, B4, but, as soon as the yeah, pawn and he does it. Yeah, as soon as Jababa pawn. punches it through, the C pawn the C pawn runs. Yeah, C three, C two. He can't stop it there, and it's just a matter of when is he going to be able to push C one. Leo James Music points out that S also stands for slip happens, as in yes, mouse slips. Yes, that's a good one. There you go. That's that must have been what it meant. I was only talking yeah. about stalemates and slips, clearly. Right. Um, and Mr. Savon, you can follow them on chess.com, not on chess base, but yes, you can. UNC the Awesome likes the logo, though. Uh, chat, do you guys have a favorite logo? I know Hess likes the Wizards. Uh, I don't. The Wizards is, is pretty BA, I got to say. The Wizards logo is... It's intimidating, and the fact that they just won their match before the last round of plays even started. Yeah, is, uh, they they have been doing extremely they're, well. They're living up to that to that uh, logo. Look at this technique here by Jababa. Rook f2, amazing move because after the trade, the knight relocates itself to d3 by force with check, mm -hmm. and uh, Jababa is moments away. Now, oh, there was also Rook takes g2 first and then knight e3, but he plays knight e3. Uh, oh, there that wouldn't have worked. Maybe it would have. I don't know, but White's White's losing a piece here. Jababa's going to win, and uh, the gentlemen are uh, are going to take a small lead of six points to five points here over the dynamite right. currently. We we haven't checked on the Armenian Eagles and the Vol yeah. Volga Stormbringers in a while because they're going to wrap up the match soon as well. Yeah, no, you're right. We can go to any game there if you see your favorite, just shout it out. But uh, right, um, okay. So Sargisian that... versus Gorazanin. Um, okay. You've got. I'm opening all their games right now. Artok Manukian versus Rodchenkov. I, I don't mm -hmm. know which game is most exciting. Let's let's go. Actually, what are we doing? Zavin already won over Ooh. Dmitry Andraken. Wow. So That's Zavin, good. Zavin plays great. an amazing game here as Black and takes down Andraken. Look at the final position here. As we uh, we keep an eye on Manukian's game versus Rodchenkov on the live board. Yep. Follow the analysis board here if you want to see exactly how Andreasian took down Andraken. Great. Um, it, whoa. I, this is like, whoa. I feel like Keanu Reeves here. Whoa. <laughs> this is... Uh, and This and, is a Botvinnik semi-Slav. Or Slav defense uh, with Botvinnik flavors, we'll say. Yeah. Um, and also, also in Manukian's game, which is going on at the same time, he's just about to win an extra pawn. He has two double pass pawns, but he definitely is the one playing for a win in this endgame. Yep. Um, and now it's tied six and a half to six and a half. So, uh, is is the MVP board four gonna help bring the win again? I seems like he will. Could be. Well, Andre Austin took down. I mean, yeah. Dimitri Andreikin is should be the strongest player on paper for either of these teams, but he did not have his best chess today. The Stormbringers uh, top board lost both to uh, the Eagles board two, and then lost this position. If you look at the analysis board, as white against Andre Austin, and this attack for Black. Just got out of control with the pawns. Look at this move. Queen C1 check. The queen nearly gets herself trapped. Um, and uh, 
and Andreasen just absolutely crushed Andreikin in this game. So, all right, we'll stay focused on the Manukin game where you are, Alexandra, and... Yep. Um, so, okay, we're back to the end games where we're trying to stick with the theme of figuring out what does White need to achieve in order to see if he can push this to a win since he's the only one who has winning chances here. Black just offered the Knight exchange, and uh, Manukin didn't take it. Yeah, but now the B4 pawn will be a problem. I guess Rook D5 says, you take mine, I take yours. Right, and he would rather trade off one of his doubled pawns. Absolutely. And, uh, Unfortunately for Black, he probably doesn't have a choice, though. Yeah. Because Rook D5 also threatens B5, punching the knight out of C6. Right, right. Um, and uh, again, another theme we've seen a lot in these endgames was the principle of creating two weaknesses. So yep. he already has a pass pawn on the B file. Now that he has one on the E file as well, he's going to be able to use these two. And yep. Black can't defend against both of, both of them. It's a great point. The other One of the other matchups going, this is Manukian, the manager on board four, should should actually get this game here as white. The game between Abdusa Turov and Martiriasian. Mm -hmm. Probably going to be a draw, um, as now now the hand is being forced here. Ab Abdu Saturov, with the white pieces, has small, slightly, slightly better chances here with the rook with the rook uh, on on the h file in the past h pawn. But probably this should be a draw. Yeah. So that means that if that uh, means this is the final game that matters. <laughs> well, no, it's not because we have we have Sargisian versus Gorazanin. So this this game may be the Got game it. if if Manukian takes his game, and that and the draws. Okay, yeah, yeah. That means that uh, that means Sargisian or Gorazan, and it could come down to this game right here. Sargisian looks to be just better here as White though, because that's a passed A pawn, and he knows how to use it. Just gonna push it. Got it. Uh. uh Hang on, which 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 game are you looking at right now? I'm looking at Sargisian versus Gorazanin. Okay. Sean Sargisian versus Mihail uh, Gorazanin. Got um, it, got it, got it. The Abdusa Turov game probably going to be a rook ending draw. We can see that on the live board. Then now you see the Sargisian game where, as I was saying, he has a passed A pawn. I don't see any reason why White isn't just winning here. Yep, yep. Um, in fact, now you have this very nice move, Queen A3 check to pin the knight. And he finds it, followed by A7. I'm assuming, and uh, Gorazanin is in big trouble. Yeah. What is he going to do here? Okay, well, it looks like this match is going to turn in favor for the Armenian Eagles, and they didn't have a good start either, so... Wally Hood, to answer your question, Platinum member in the Chess TV chat, the matches are saved at the Twitch TV channel they're, they're broadcast from, so in this case, Twitch TV slash chess, but we also put the full broadcast on YouTube, as well as on chess.com. So if you just joined us and you do want to back back it up and check out the whole thing, there's going to be plenty of places where you can see the full replay. Right. And you, we are also going to have a highlight show after with uh, International right. Master Levy Rosman and with uh, Bigfoot. That, who that, is that highlight show popular. is every Wednesday. Right. Every Wednesday. So it's kind of a halfway show. They, they, they provide highlights of what happened on Tuesday. They sort of preview the chess today. And then next week, if there's any really exciting things that happen here, they might even talk about it then. But, um, yeah, check out the halfway highlight show uh, to see what happened if you missed it. Great. Okay, so it looks like uh, – so, sorry, you see it has this game in the bag. Um any other game in this match finish? Okay, it's 7-7. Yeah, well, this match is going to be coming down to to this game here, and I'm assuming Sargisian takes it as white. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and now even moves like rook b1 um, should be enough because the reason is that knight d2 is met by queen b2, and uh, Sargisian can just force the ladies off the board and, right. then, and then be winning. Um, although, actually... In that line, yeah. Okay, he goes. This is this is the other way to do it. But in this line, actually, that wasn't the worst defensive idea there. With queen eight, uh, with knight d two. Yeah, for Gorazanin, because what he's trying to do is create a scenario where he can give up his bishop for the pawn, but win the bishop on f one, and then be down the exchange in an end game, but have some decent drawing chances. So right, right. Okay, white white should still be winning, but trying to but figure th out that, that the was a good way, way to, to try it. to. 
you know a last desperado defense uh, in case no he, he found it that was a that was a very nice way to finish it off rook d1 the reason everybody is after knight takes f1 you're not touching the knight you're mm -mm. taking the bishop with check on d5 and promoting and promoting so yeah that, rook that's takes actually d5, gonna do it game over really nice tactic you pointed out there yep. and with that game the eagles move to eight to seven which means our, all our talk needs to do is get a Which draw. Which means all our talk has to do is draw in a position where he's completely winning his white. And the defending champions are going to start off the right way with a win here in week one. And it really comes down to that, that game we just saw previously, that, that queen sack where, where white was one move away from Manukin resigning. Remember? Right. And, and, and he allowed this brilliant queen takes g3 tactic. So uh, if you're just joining us, you should definitely consider checking that out. Uh, backing up the broadcast because uh, the Eagles, they kind of stole a victory here from the Jaws of Defeat. And uh, and congrats yeah. to them because I'm assuming Mnuchin's going to convert this one pretty easily. Yeah, and I, I know Mnuchin has been playing so strong. He, is, he seems to have a higher playing strength than both his rating and his title. I feel like from what we've seen this match and last year's, he, he seems like at least FM strength. One of the interesting things about Artok Mnuchin is... His feed eight rating, which is what's used in the pairings here, is actually not his most accurate rating. He he lived in the United States, right? Uh, for actually about, I believe it was at least five or six years, and played okay. a lot of U.S. chess, uh, where where his rating, I believe, almost reached about twenty four hundred. Okay, so our talk is he is indeed a stronger player than his feed eight rating. Which um, has led some to ask us whether that's fair that we use the feed eight rating and let him be on board for. Right, yeah. rules are How rules, and uh, it's it's which, difficult. Which ratings to use what? for this event? Yeah, and and it's something it's something to consider because it's very difficult to monitor national federations because the moment you open right. that door, the moment you open that door, and someone starts saying, "Well, my you know Zib Zimbabwe rating happens to be twelve hundred, yeah. and I'd like to use that rating instead of my higher FIDE rating." So it's not as simple. And Greg Shahad, I live I leave Greg with all the tough questions. Right, not my job. Greg has to figure out the rules. I just work here. Yeah, um that's true and so, um a lot of tournaments have that this difficulty and they normally just pick the highest highest rating or your fide is the most accurate probably in this case right. for our talk since it's harder to gain fide normally than uscf but okay let's get back to some of the games yep, so and our talk yeah. does win that game congratulations to him the eagles right. indeed have won the first round match got it so we have the armenian eagles and the moscow winners who already won the match so we have the other four teams still battling it out so let's go check on check in on some of them yeah we're, we're showing vlad Dubrov's game now on both boards but i'm going to see what we got with some other games that might be of uh, of interest. There's a lot of interesting positions here. If you want to go to the chess.com live server yourself, you are invited to do so, mm -hmm. and uh, and check out and choose your own adventure. Um, but right. uh, let's. But okay, let me... let's let's stay right here on Vlad Dubrov's game for a second. Actually, I think I, I think I see I think I see where we're going. Let's go to this game between Demetov and Lushenkov, which is uh, Kulik with a four and versus Mikhail uh, right. Lushenkov. Okay, we're, we're, we're focusing on the endings now. Um, yeah. This has been a lot of fun, and we found that this is often where the some Some instructive moments happen, for sure. And the instructive moments, yeah, exactly. Okay, so at, at first glance, the material is equal here. Both sides have two pawns, a knight, and a rook endgame. Um, that being said, White's king is a lot more active. Black's already on h8, but he does have some tactical combinations here. He's attacking the rook, he's attacking the knight, but White is also threatening b7, which would attack the knight. So there's going to be a lot of calculating going on here. Both sides are pretty comfortable with over six minutes, which is not bad for an endgame position, yeah. given the rapid time control. I think that one of the questions will be if, if, if White can use his pass pawns to create mating threats, where Black can't really do the same with his pass pawns, right? Mm -hmm. And so, how do you do that here? Well, first you have to deal with the fact that you got to defend the knight. I'm guessing rook g6 is the move. Um, mm -hmm. And if you can play rook g6, relocate this knight from e6 to maybe d8 and f7, you can just use your imagination to say that there might be some sort of mating net. Or, ooh! Rook takes b7, right. Because if rook takes e6, white gets the knight back. So potentially he might just be winning a winning pawn with two here. pawns in the rook ending, and and that's yeah. a transition we talk about where you say, 
what happens if X pieces are traded? Here, mm -hmm. White realized that going into the rook ending, as long as he won that pawn, would have been winning. Now White yeah. can play knight g5, and actually that just looks crushing. Yeah, cause... so he, he kind of combined the, the idea you were mentioning earlier with trying to figure out how to take advantage of Black's stuck king, try to checkmate, but also grabbing the extra pawn in case pieces are traded. He's in a better endgame anyway. Yep. And I don't even know what Black does on knight g5, because knight g5 threatens the move h6, and then rook b8 is mate. Yeah. That's um, true. And in fact, I mean, so White exactly what he play. does he have to White play it. rookie eight here? H six is still coming. Oh, this does not look good for Black. Painful. Yeah. Painful to put your your rook on the back rank and just you know beg for mercy. True. So. Well, uh, yeah, I think that with this game, Demidov is all he all. He, it's not really the most relevant game, although we are covering it because as we pointed out, the Wizards have already won this match, but it does help the Phoenix save some face, right? True, true. And, uh, and not, not just get slaughtered here, so oh. um, well. we'll keep an eye on it, but let's give a little more love to this uh, Tbilisi Gentleman versus Delhi Dynamite matchup here. For sure. Um, particularly the game between Nihal Sarin and Bador Javava. Um, Sarin has been a fun player to watch this match. Well, I mean, he mouse slipped last game. I know, so he's but, he's not in the best mood right now, but yep. he's still been playing well. It's not, you know, most slips happen. The nice thing about, so I mean, and Sarin is one of the more active players on chess.com, so if you're saying, like, hey, like, what, you know, maybe some players are less comfortable with online formats, I mean, that's definitely not the case with a with usually a young grandmaster like that, and so um, really shocking to see him lose that last game, and the fact that the Dynamite are down just one point, that's really the difference in the match, right? You take away that victory and give it back to the Dynamite, and we're tied 6-6 heading into this last round of play. So if right. maybe Sarn redeems himself with a huge win with the black pieces over Jabava, but that's going to be a tall task. <laughs> Keshmenk is saying mouse slips make it fun, though. Yeah, it makes them, it reminds us that these Grandmasters are also human, you know? Yep. Um, and... But, uh, you feel bad for them. Okay. Let, let's check out the other game in this, uh, another game with another big name, Tanya Sachdev. Yeah. Um, taking yeah. on Nika Volkov. Um, right. Sachdev is with the white pieces and another isolated queen pawn. She actually has a video series on chess.com about isolated queen pawn play. So a lot of her opening repertoire reaches IQP positions. Oh. And so if you want to check that out, um, Tanya Sachdev knows a thing or two about how to play the white, or let's say the the attacking side against a weakness like an IQP. Got it. And so hopefully she's going to also demonstrate that in the game. I, I think she, this is already looking very tough for Black. Honestly, after knight b5, I know that it maybe seems close to equality at first glance, but you got to deal with a7, because if you don't guard a7, that knight will steal the pawn and happily retreat. Right. So if, if a move like queen b8 is met by bishop g3, this is kind of a very common full board retreat. Now the queen is forced to a8, and here comes knight c7. So that's why the queen went back to b6. But why, Tanya's choosing between good plans here. I mean, she can challenge the c-file. Right. Um, she can try to figure out ideas of a4 and a5, even by, like, protecting the b-pawn and then really trying to expose the queen over here. Right, um, right. So um, liking White's position a lot. Yeah. I, I do as well. Um, and I, I agree. I think challenging the C file is the most natural plan here. Yep, and she did it. Yeah, she just did that. Um, so I guess what Black can try to do here is, I mean, he needs to activate his little rooks a little bit. He's not, he's not going to take on C1 and bring White's rook to the open file. Is it easier for White to double on the C file here or for Black? Because Black can try rook C4. That's a which, good move. I think Black Which should. I like, because if, if the rook takes, then sh he gets rid of his isolated pawn. And if he doesn't, he can double up his rooks. Yep. I like rook C4. I think one, one issue is can I take E6 First, is there some line where I take e6 and eliminate the bishop, and then, and then look to take right. c4? It's right. It's, it's tricky. Okay, um, a, a5. That's also an instructive move for us to highlight because one of the ways you get counterplay when you have the weak pawn is try to create targets in your opponent's structure. So a5 just has a direct intention of undermining the a3 and b4 pawn. Right. Um. Okay. So a4. 
Is White ever going to want to take on E6? And at what point would that make sense? Um, not yet, because the bishop is really poorly placed on E6. He's just acting like a pawn. So all she has to do is figure out how to deal with A takes B4. Yeah. Because if Tanya takes back on A5, then her pawn on A3 is also a little bit weak, and it's much easier to attack with a bishop queen and maybe bringing in a rook later on. <laughs> Still better for white, I think, e even in that kind of line. But I agree that probably the best idea is to find a way to use your strong knights and, and something where they're, in, where they're placed now. The, the threat of bishop g3 keeps popping back in my head because now it threatens bishop c7, which mm -hmm. would win the exchange. Right. So perhaps she's taking some time here to calculate exactly how to best use her, her active knights and, and maybe a move like bishop g3 is a candidate. Yeah, Vlad Dubrov that, did that win again, sense. by the way. So if I'm doing my math correctly, did he go 4-0 today? I think he uh, might have. Vlad? I think so. I'll, I'll definitely check. So he, he now helps the Wizards get an even more dominant score on the board. Yeah, he did go 4-0. He is so the only go. player so far today. So that's nicely a, done. That's a Pro wow. Chess League debut right there by somebody who will be leading the Wizards all season long. Yeah. Um, and the only other person who did that yesterday was ding lorenz so uh we had a we had nice a couple of different we had a couple four o's um we had i believe Ilya nizhnik as well as yvonne sarich when we were covering the atlantic division uh early part of tuesday let's remind everybody who's up right after us as yeah we have sorry a couple... i was i was referring to the pacific division but yeah good point yeah no i would say you guys had one i believe ding Ren was your only one we had mm -hmm. we had four uh, but right after us is the Central Division, where the players in front of you will be making their 2019 debuts. Um, pick your flavor, whoever you think is your favorite to follow. Obviously, a bunch of really, really strong players and a bunch of big names in the chess world. You got JKD, Jorg Meyer, MVL, um, uh, JVF. Look at all the three names. I just realized it's the three name division. So this explains why you've been so into the acronyms today. <laughs> yeah, J J F uh, JVF, MVL. Speaking of MVL, the most probably famous acronym in chess, Maxime Vachet Le Grave, will be streaming from his own channel. Uh, if you hold your mouse over the Twitch player, if you're watching at Twitch, there are some extensions. Of course, you can follow my channel as well as Alexandra's and the official Pro Chess League channel, which we encourage you to do. Yeah, uh, but also, if you follow the Pro Chess League channel, that's where you're going to see the Wednesday highlight show. So you don't want to miss that. Levy and Vic are a great commentary team. Would yeah. 10 out of 10 recommend. And uh, yeah, so do that. Go to the Pro Chess League channel, follow it so you get alerts. And you can also go to twitch.tv slash Leon Beast, I believe, or is it MVL Chess? I don't even remember. But it's MVL Chess. Okay, so that's the producer correcting me there. Um, so uh, go to twitch.tv slash mvlchess and give him a follow as well if you want to see his own view as he plays. Well, I just did that, so... <laughs> yeah, I don't... I, I'm pretty sure I'm already following it, but, you know... Okay, right. I should probably one step do ahead. One step ahead. Yeah. All right. Um, cool. All right, well, Tanya did take on e6, which changes the structure from an IQP weakness to one where now black has different weaknesses, including the pawn on g6 and the light square problems over here. Yeah. H7, I mean, at G6, first when F7. I was looking at it, knight takes e6 didn't make sense to me because it just helps black bring in another yep. pawn. But I really like what you just pointed out about transitioning from the type of weaknesses you're focusing on. Right. And now she plays queen g6, which is really irritating if you're black. I mean, now I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to go sacrifice here, Alexandra, and I know I tend to do that. But the idea is there may even be a rook takes b7, queen takes, and then knight takes e6, just to yeah. show you how... How actually realistic that is. If takes, takes, Whoa. shake, and bake. Okay. If you play bishop f8, you would just lose the rook on d8. So there, there is actually a legit threat here for white to just come crashing through. Oh, rook d8. So does that work right away? Well, so I guess rook c8 now, knight yeah. e6 doesn't threaten the rook anymore. Exactly. So Not, kind of but hold on. No, but hold on. You may be right anyway. Rook b7 takes, knight e6. How do you guard g7? If you do it with the bishop, I play bishop takes f6. True. Um, well, you can if, play bishop d8. Bishop d8? Uh, you're, there you you're go, you're right. protecting with the queen and protecting the bishop. I, I don't... Well, I, I, you could still take on d8 and play bishop takes f6, but... but True. But True. I'm not you sure can, it's you enough. You just get rid of the bishop then. Um, well, Tanya's gonna have to do... Oh, she she just played bishop okay. d3. Okay, this so maybe also, that line. Also sure. good. She wants to put the bishop on e5. Mm-hmm. And again, I know we said that, and it wasn't just a shameless plug to her video series, if you're a Diamond member, but I mean, she really knows these positions, like no joke. And she's she's very comfortable playing against the Isolated Queen Pawn, so this transition by her 
very technical. I really like the way she's playing. I love the threat of bishop e5. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if she gets this win, you know, it's also huge for the match, right? The Dynamite yeah. are currently down two games. So between this one and Nihal Sauron playing the black pieces versus Bador Jabava, we have a couple big games. Let's check out the one we haven't really covered yet uh, in this match, um, or at least in this round of play, which is Kainapon, Priya Darshan Kainapon versus David Jojou. Jua, Jua, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I apologize. Okay. Uh, that is, uh, that's the game Aspired versus Jajka 007. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Really close position here. <laughs> yep. This, but this is kind of a, this is honestly kind of a, a Nimzo gone good for black. Nimzo gone good. Okay. And, uh, okay. And it's not like exactly a it Nimzo. It was, it was probably kind of like a Catalan or like a Rubenstein. Actually, mm -hmm. oh, it was a Dutch. Okay. Yeah, because there, there's the pawn on F5. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I said it was a Nimzo, because there are a lot of variations in the Nimzo where you move the knight from F6 and then play F5 later with exactly this idea of relocating right. the queen to the king side. And, yeah. And, and, and in the Nimzo, you also often have the pawn on A3 on an, and on A4. So I can see why you might have thought it was a Nimzo. But I, I like Black's chances here. White's, White's idea is to play C5 probably in a lot of positions and just really try to break through with some counterplay. Um. I feel a little bit biased toward black because his natural attack is going to be one that attacks the king. Right, um, and so, you do favor that, especially when they're not your pieces, but probably Of course I do, and, but it's also rapid, right? Yeah, it's also it is rapid. rapid, so... Yep. It's, um, harder, to, it's harder to defend uh, yep. in rapid, that's for sure. So, yeah, this is pretty typical. F5 versus F4, who is going to get the attack going on first? Knight G4 seems like something that black is considering, although after H3... Doesn't seem like it's a serious threat yet. Also, All right, as much as E5 I... at some point. Yeah, E5 and F4 for black, right? Yeah. Okay, and as much as I want to stay right here because we've been talking about the movers match, I think we need to go back to the horses and... Mo uh, sorry, we've been talking about the dynamite versus gentleman here, but I think we need to go back to the horses versus the movers because if we start with... Uh, sorry, not this game here. If we start with the top board matchup, Jan Elvis versus Adiban Baskaron. Okay. This is only this is currently only a one game match, right? I mean the the horses are are trailing by by a single point. Yeah. So uh, if Elvis can do what he does pretty well, which is attack the Black King here, this move H four H five, this might be what the horses need to level it up. And wow. I'm looking at some Holy of the other smash. games. That's Maylib twelve versus Fireheart one Fireheart nine two. But I'm gonna. Okay. I'm going to quickly switch from that, from Gusta Fruta versus Swaminathan. Uh, Sander Koo, Gusta Fruta. One of my favorite okay. usernames, by the way, Gusta Fruta. Gusta Fruta, that's a good one. It's a good one, right? It's fun Gu to say. It's very fun to say, yeah. Gusto Fruta is uh, defending here. It looks like Swaminathan might be about to clinch this thing for her team. Bishop takes h6. Look at Whoa, that what is going on here? Um... I love it. The bishop is pinned to the king. Here she comes. It's, it's, and, this is good. This is over. I think Swami Nathan is going to yeah. crush uh, Mr. Kook here and and almost clinch the match victory for the movers. Incredible. Yeah. What can Black do? If Rook look, takes look at this move eight, now. Look take. at this move, Alexander. Bishop. Oh, I Bishop didn't do F8. it. Bishop Oh. Okay. No, I think I think Bishop F5 was even stronger. Bishop F5. You just, okay. Let's you, take you a look. You sacrificed the Bishop on F5, and if the Queen had taken, Queen G7 was checkmate. The Bishop on F8 is pinned. Oh, that that's also very nice. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, okay, she's still winning here. She's just going to take on B8, I believe. Yeah. yeah, and she's just up a piece, but I think she missed the most forcing win, which was, again, was Bishop F5, followed by uh, lights out on G7. Yeah, so, too bad. Yeah, this is a puzzle rush, she wouldn't You know, if she was doing point, her puzzle rush, you know? there you go, kids. You heard it. Alexander said it, not me. So, do your puzzle rush. <laughs> yeah, do your puzzle rush, and don't get frustrated. What's, what's your high score on puzzle rush, by the way? Uh, it's 35 so far, but 35. I'm working up. I'm trying to. The goal is to one day get to 40. I I literally got 42 the day we launched it, and I'm still at 42. Oh, okay. So well, hey, in my in my high. defense, in, high. in my defense, I pretty much only use it on the app, and I think I'm just that much slower. Okay. That's... So I need I need to I need to have like a stream of just five hours of nonstop puzzle rush and just. Let the magic happen naturally. Yeah, and you should keep a song on repeat. I heard it helps you play better. Is that Hikaru's advice? No, I, I may have done that for two hours, but ah. that's okay. It okay. was torture.
<laughs> All right, well, uh, this game is over. Swaminathan wins because after the move knight g4 by Sander Kook, uh, bishop h6 check was coming. And so yeah. uh, with that, the movers have moved themselves a little bit closer to clinching this match over the horses. Uh, one of the last games we have here is, uh, well, actually not that one. I'm going to try to find it here. Uh, okay. Let me... Okay, well, we have Lodva. Let's go to Lodva versus Purinik, actually. All right. Lodva yep. versus Purinik is... Uh, we have Agzer versus Abidabi. Yep, I'm, I'm right here with you. So, looking at the position, let's just do a quick piece count. Okay, so... Wow, th there's a lot of imbalances here. So, uh, Black has a rook... He has... A bishop and a knight for one of the rooks, okay? And he has pawns up. Cash, Cash Meng, thank you again with the bits. I was just scrolling through chat here. Hey, Chess Bay. I see you hey, just got Bay here. and Birdman. How are you guys? How's thank it you going, for peeps? Uh, Cash... Is there a tie break for 8-8, eight, eight, or does it just end as a draw? It ends as a draw. If I, yeah, yep, Greg said that as well. All right, well, we've got Lodva here versus Purinik. Um, as we said, this is currently kind of the, the, the next match that's about to finish. Lodva yeah. is better here as white, maybe. No, actually, he's up the exchange, I'm... so I said that, but the more I look at it, that knight is just a monster. Yeah, no, this position yeah. definitely takes a lot of uh, second glances to try to figure out what's going on. F F3, okay, so he's just trying to trade off, which Black doesn't want to do. But if, um, if Lodva can, can find a way to just create some chances for the Rook, I do believe that, that Jan Elvist is... Uh, if we check on the game with Malev, Malev 212 versus Fireheart, this is this looks like a dangerous attack. Although, actually, after that last move, Rook takes e4, suddenly I'm looking at the light square diagonal and the threat of Rook g4, and yeah. now who's better? Yeah, uh, Elvis had to play the move knight f4, so maybe... Right. Maybe this is going to be one of those matches that was really close at the sending into this last round, but the uh, movers might be pulling away. Okay, well, I'm sure that's what, what they want to see so far. Okay, yeah, it is 6-8, so they are they are almost winning. Just need half a point more. Half a point more, and it looks like uh, Voskaron is doing just fine now against Elvis, and I said I, I, you know, I'm, I was, for this horse, is hopeful that Lodva could get something, but the more I look at this down the exchange position with that knight on d2, the more I think that black has... Black's advantage is, uh, is pretty nice. Yeah. Oh, we have Nubbins Goody in the chat as well. Uh, welcome to the chat, our uh, Tetris champion. Nubbins. Checking out the chess once again. Do people just shout out, like, Nubbins whenever he joins the chat, or is that something I just did? Nubbins. Uh, no, I, I. It sounds, you know, kind of catchy. It sounds like Nubbins. Like, what's up? Remember the what's up commercials? Or are you too young for that? Uh, I am young, but I do remember. So you do it's remember okay. that, okay? I do remember. All right. Yeah. Well, Bishop takes F three was threatening Rook G two mate, and that oh, is. Oh, indeed... BJ, thanks for gifting to Nubbins. Okay, sorry. Uh, back to it. Rook B, Rook uh Rook G two mate was threatened on the board, and after Rook takes F three, that would not have stopped Black from having an edge, and so, after the move, Rook to A two. Purinik is sort of uh, just toying with White's position here, honestly. I mean, he's up almost four minutes on the clock. He right. can trade rooks and have no business losing, meaning if the movers just want to clinch this match, Purinik could easily just trade these rooks. Oh, no, you know what he's about to do? He's about to just play tickle. He's going to tickle with the rooks until the until the perpetual happens. And, yeah, uh, which... I think, is I think, that what he should be going for? I mean, they're going to... Well, I mean, I he's a team player. I think I think he knows that the moment this ends in a draw, the movers clinch the match. And, and right. I think no, now... I'm asking if that's what White should be going for. I mean, he is in a worse position, but would you try to force anything? I guess probably not, because even if they get a slightly better score and they lose the match, it's still Well, better. the position has already repeated more than three times. and So they just with... have to claim it. What happens if they make a move and nobody claims? They can't go back, right? If the position changes, you can't claim it. But if the if the if they just go on forever, eventually the server, I believe, will claim it. I believe we we curtail the kind of the fide rules there, which is exactly what just happened. Meaning, 
if the position happens like more than five or six times, it'll just be just claimed. Then you just automatically yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, very cool. Cool tidbit. All right. Well, congratulations to the movers who now have clinched the match over the horses. But let's go back to this game with Elvis versus Boscaron because it is still exciting. The Black King is on F7 and maybe under fire if White can play Knight H3, Knight G5. Right? Come on. Get excited. Come on. We are getting excited. Um, okay. So... Queen E5. Well, so Adivan is just playing for. Uh, I think he's. I think he's playing for, for the win himself here. I mean, now because is... he's, he's going to win. He doesn't have any pressure on himself anymore. Um, yep. And I and th now Elvis is about to be under thirty seconds. Right. And I, I'm guessing that even while these players are playing, they do know the results their teammates have because they're in the same room, right? Yeah. Well, in yeah. many cases, they're in the, not always. They're not always in the same room, but they follow the standings, right? It's yeah. not hard. Not hard to follow it. Uh, while they're playing, so it is uh, hard. Maybe if they're in time pressure, right? Uh, but well, in, just... in a close match, I believe you'd be right. Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be hard under time pressure. But why can't Black just take the knight? Oh, queen g seven. Uh, because queen g seven looks scary. And then scary. king e six. Um. Seems like a bowl full of jelly to me. But maybe yeah. just king g seven too. Okay, yeah, he Boston... can just take. He can just take. Yeah, I didn't just... calculate it out. He's not afraid. Um. He's not. He's not scared. He takes it. The movers are going to win this one, 9F, 6.5. So let's go right. back to the last match in progress that really matters, and that is yeah. the one Elvis between... Elvis is trying to get something, but there's no perpetual. Okay, so next game that matters. The Gentleman and the Dynamite. Right now we have Lexi Sexy taking on Nihal Sarin in an endgame that looks like it's going to be a draw, and unfortunately yeah. for the Dynamite, that's not going to be. That's not going to cut it. Nope. Nope, you, and are... you, you have the scores there. Okay, great. If you are just joining us, a very unfortunate thing happened for Mr. Sarin, who was 2-0 and before this game. In the last round game, Nihal Sarin actually mouse-slipped and just blundered his queen on one move. So, again, if you take away that point and give it back to the Dynamite, we are literally deadlocked at six and a half games apiece right now. So, Oh, man, that's a terrible feeling. Terrible feeling, right? This game is going to end in a draw, so Sarin has to feel semi okay that he's going to hold a draw i think as black against um jababa in fact now after king c7 knight knight check this is just uh any an, an easy draw actually an easy Although, draw so wait, i wait, mean wait. he has to protect his bishop and then he jababa's just, getting the pawn on a7 is this still an blunder? easy draw uh no i think it, it should still be an easy draw it's just just got to be a little creative i guess king c6 okay. I, I, so let's see so he's going to let the the knight drop on a7 but then can he take away knight square? Or he's just going to get his king to b6 eventually, right? He, king c6 and king b6? No? He goes back to d7, but what is he doing here? There's, He's actually creating a really tough... Oh, he calculated oh, that he could just nice. win the a1. Nice. Yeah, okay. So he just forced into a draw. Okay, accurate, precise. I, I love people in the chess.com chat on this game saying, You're so cool. You're the best. Um, yeah. Well, now they said accept you're not, but accept that's you're okay. not, which Hang makes on. sense. I get that a lot. So yeah, it's a, um, it's a tough life. <laughs> it's a tough life. It's a tough life, uh, and uh, a very creative way to draw. By the way, I, if you don't know your endgame theory, kids, let me show you something on the analysis board here. And I say kids in the joking way. I mean, I'm not. I'm not trying to sound in any way sort of. Papa the, Sasha is calling Pop, all Uncle, the Uncle kids. Uncle Sasha's here, Uncle and I'll, Sasha, I'll guide come, you to some come chess children knowledge. Children gather, yeah. So. Here's the thing, baby birds. I'll feed you this chess knowledge because when you're aware of the type of endgames that are just theoretical draws, it's kind of like knowing somebody can't win with the extra bishop when it's the wrong color corner, Alexandra, like in the bishop right. in, in the corner pawn. This is the same sort of thing. In in these endgames where you're actually playing against a knight in a corner pawn, the only way for them to win is to be able to get the king to protect the pawn. And right. so the issue with this with this force variation for white is that Sarin forces the pawn all the way up, and there's no way for the white king to ever get in here to help out. Right. So ultimately what happened is exactly what we saw. If the white king comes over, you would love to be able to bring your king around, but the moment the king touches down on any one of these close squares, it's stalemate. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're not guarding the pawn with the king, then you can never move the knight because that's also a draw. 
So uh, a very just like when you have the f that's why you study your end games because that gives you foresight. People always say it's okay. Some of these obscure endings they say this phrase. Well, I'm never going to reach that ending, so why do I need to know it, right? But it, right. it improves your decision making in the more complicated positions right before that, right? Yeah, you may not actually get that, but it makes you a stronger end game player because you're able to sort of steer the ship in a direction that you wouldn't know you need to steer the ship if you don't know your end game. So study. There you go. I, that's I that's like what it. You do. I like it. And a lot of end games also have a lot of similar patterns. So even if you don't get that particular ending, yep, you're great still going to be able to recognize it. Also, to Blissy Gentleman, eight six. Um, they are they are very they close. Half a point more. Well, yep. I just I just moved to the meet up the line board, which is the game with Conopin, uh versus Zhuja. Zhuja. I'm gonna I'm gonna research how I say that name before next week. Yeah. Hashtag yeah. you're welcome. And uh. I'll, I'll do the same. <laughs> um, okay, so there's only two games left. So the Dynamite, I, I think I think the, one of the bigger disappointing results of this round is that if you look at the analysis board, Tanya Sachtev was unable to get the victory as white over Volkov, which frankly is surprising because I really like liked her chances in the position. It looks like what she did, if you look at the analysis board, Alexandra, Yep. Is she miscalculated and thought she was just winning on the move rook b6, so she sacrificed a rook. Okay. Because what this does is it puts the queen on an undefended square, so that after knight f5, the pawn is pinned to the to the queen there. The problem is that after bishop f6, white had nothing more than a perpetual check with all this all this this uh, sacrifice was just nothing. Yeah, I'm checking out your analysis board that. That makes perfect sense. I like the way you explained it but there. But it, it's frustrating if you're Sasha because she didn't need to do that. Rook b6 was unnecessary. I mean, play yeah. the move Play the move bishop e5. Uh, play something that keeps the pressure for white. So I think if you're the uh, the dynamite, that's one that really feels like it got away with you. Not not exactly as bad as Nihal Sarin's mouse slip. That's but, true, but, but they were counting on her, and now they're probably going to lose the match. Right. Um, because, again, so, if you take back Nihal Sorin's mouse slip, and if Tanya, I think, converts on that position a lot of the times as white, she knows those positions, and uh, now now, um, now they're really up against it. So what's the other game that's still going? There's two. We have... Yeah, we have uh, Grandmaster Jojua against Grandmaster Canapan, and we also have uh, the... Grandmaster Kuparazdi against Grandmaster Grover. And where is that? Um, they should be, they should be the, the last 15, two games going on. So there's only two of them going on right there now. There it is. There it is. For yeah. some reason, that was the only one I didn't have up. So let's take yeah, a look no at that. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Okay. Let's see. Which one should we take a look at first? Um, it looks like, well, both of them are very interesting. Um, in the Canapan game, we have Black looking like... Yeah, he, Canapan he is win here, right? Yeah, Canapan is bringing the pressure. Yeah. He's going to make this close. I think if if he gets this win for the Dynamite, they're not out of it yet. Yeah. Because how does how, how does, does White he deal? defend against Rook takes G four? Yeah, I was going to say, how does White deal with Rook takes G four? It's yep. just as they would say, it's on the board, you know. Yeah. Rook takes G four. Yeah. Um, um. And then after Rook takes G four, so sure. Um, Black is going to be up a pawn, but I think it's more than that. He's probably going to checkmate his opponent soon. So let's can, go can look White at this other game because I I think that yeah I think Canapan is going to get this one. So this this other game here where Siraj Grover is unfortunately White in an end game that he has yeah. nothing but losing chances. In fact, yeah, yeah. unfortunately okay. this is going to be the decisive game. He's yeah, yeah what, oh and he in resigned. fact he just he just resigns, which means that yeah. we're back to the game. Yeah, uh, with so, Canapan, and mean, and it means that all four matches are officially right. in the books. Should yeah, be should I, be noted that Lexi Sexy was hanging out. Wow, Birdman oh. coming through with the big bits. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you, thank you, Birdman. And um, also, I am International Master Rose and just raided this ch the Chess.com stream with a party of 120, 20, 1,200 two people. Sorry, <laughs> a, th a thousand two hundred. No, no, one hundred twenty. No, thank you, thank you, Eric. Of course, uh, appreciate it. Uh, if you're not following Eric Rosen's channel, you can also do that on Twitch. Last, not last week, excuse me, two days ago, he was covering uh, action from St. Louis for the Webster Windmills. So he'll be doing coverage, I believe, for Webster all year. Yeah. Um, so uh, what well, I was going to say is Lexi, Lexi Sexy, is that, that's Badur Jabav has been hanging out in the chat. We talked about how Fabiano Carwan and Wesley So were cheerleaders on Tuesday.
right. for, for the St. Louis team. And uh, that's one of the most exciting things about the team event is that the top players are hanging around cheering for, you know, their 2100 rated teammates. And it's uh, it's a cool it's a cool environment. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, OK, well, so a uh, question then. For yep. teams that lost the first round, they do still have a chance to place into uh, the top top four and make it still, right? So it's not decisive yet, even if they lost this first game. Absolutely. If, you, if you're talking about, like, the chance of making the playoffs, right? Yeah, yeah, the chance yeah. of making the playoffs. Exactly. A so absolutely. I mean, there's, there's 10 weeks in the season, and, and uh, as, as we are getting ready to bring this show to a close, we'll remind some of the 2,500 of you still with us. Thank you for being here of kind of some of the general league information you may not know. But uh, we believe Canapan's going to win this game. It's going to be right. a final score here of 9-7 to seven for the gentlemen. But let's talk to people about the schedule if we can remind them of uh, what the full year looks like. As, as Alexandra asked yeah. Just because you lose week one doesn't mean you're out of it. Not at all. Look at that. We have 10 weeks of regular season play. Yep. Um, including three special round robin events. Those are highlighted in blue. Make sure you mm -hmm. check out those because it's really fun when you see – okay, both formats are exciting. In, in the traditional format, Alexandra, you have board ones like Carwana who play board four, board three, board two of the other teams as well, right? Right. In the round robin formats, you get a lot more just like straight top GM action on, t on top GM action, right? Um, yeah, for sure. That's so, going to be super exciting to watch. Yeah, and then the playoffs begin in March. Um, with The uh, the date will be changed. I'm just going to say it right now. Uh, one of those quarterfinal dates will actually be April 3rd. We will update that very soon. It was a decision just made last night between me and Greg in order to okay. avoid conflicting with the U.S. championship as well as uh, a big event in Europe. It might even be um, one of the European team championships, if I remember correctly. But uh, And then the finals, May 4th and 5th, will be live We'll tell you exactly where and when or how you can come and yeah, so uh, get your tickets for that. Yeah, so we hope to see you guys actually show up in person there. Yep. Uh, we were there last year. The event was a blast, so hopefully more friendly faces. All right, Rook C1 check. Again, Canapan is, is, is doing work here. This is good technique, and it's important for the Dynamite because as you highlighted in the standings, right, you want to get every point you can because right. you have 10 weeks to get as the total points really, really will matter in regards to who gets in the playoffs. Winning the match gives you a bonus 10 points, but yep. your score your score can really add up. If you lose a whole bunch of really close matches, you may still have a chance to get in the playoffs. Right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, every win will give them an extra one point in the standing, so that's also very important. Yep. As Canavan puts this way, I want to remind everybody who may have just been getting here exactly what that is above our head. We have Chesify, who was hosting the official... Uh, game location for the Armenia Eagles, the reigning Pro Chess League champions. Uh, we've seen the logos of things like the St. Louis uh, Chess Club, who obviously hosts the St. Louis Archbishops, um, and uh, the Marshall Chess Club. Uh, I'm going to try to remember to thank all of our sponsors. I'm not going to do it right now, one, because I can't even read that logo above me. Um, so, you know, the point is there are a lot of sponsors who support their local or sometimes just their favorite Pro Chess League team. If your company is interested in doing that, a little bit of advertising, support a good cause, and we're getting more and more sponsors. The reason why we came up with that widget is because we already have like seven more sponsors, four teams this year than we did last year, and so that's um, amazing. Um, if and you're interested, these sponsors, and what are these sponsors helping the teams with for people who just got here? Right, financial aid, obviously. Um, some of these, some of these teams are attracting big free agents, and they pay those professionals money. Uh, right. They're providing so that's them how we're getting the top talent in here. Yep, they're providing them with support from a location perspective. Some of them really provide a nice spread. I'm really hungry right now, so I'm going to keep coming back to that. Could really use – who's going to cater our when – are, when are you going to start catering our thing here? Uh, you're yeah, asking you. Aaron? When are you going to – like, I mean, Aaron's it, already doing so much work here. When are we going to cater him as a better – Let's show the Studio C here so we can show everybody – exactly where Aaron should be putting the food that he's going to come up with, I believe, next week. Look at that desk over there, right next to Magnus. He's been hanging out on the... Magnus looks a little hungry. Maybe that's why he's frowning. Yeah, that explains a lot now. Maybe Magnus is just always hungry. There's a lot of room on this massive desk. This, hey, I need all of this space. I need... Don't mess with my space. I need... I got everything I need. I got multiple monitors, so you know Danny you can you can fit some. Asked for the biggest desk we could possibly make him. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually not true, but it is funny. Um, anyway, I won't I won't start making inappropriate jokes that I shouldn't make. What I will do is go back to the main coverage with Alexandra and 
Uh, thank you for being my co-host, uh, or I'm your co-host. We, we flew this plane together. The Eastern Division is officially wrapped up. Yeah. Uh, Canapan wins, and these are the standings, if we can pull them up and show everybody. Before we head into the Central Division and hand things off to Grandmaster Robert Hess and Grandmaster Armand Hamilton, H&H, &H, throwing down, Hess and Hambo. Why don't That'll people call Hamilton fun. Hambo? That's uh, it. From now on, Hamilton say, is Hambo. You know? Hambo. That's it. Yep. Um, but the Central Hambo Division... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just adding on a little bit there, but go ahead. So the no, Central you go division... for it. Anytime someone's adding on to nicknames, I love it. Go for it. Well, I... I just thought it sounded great. That's all. Okay. Well, Hambo, Hambo will be will be doing coverage with Hess, um, and uh, Maxime Vacher Legrave will be doing his own streaming. Right. So, and people are getting really hyped on that. I think we linked his uh, stream in the chat already. Yep. Twitch.tv slash MVL Chess. You guys can check it out there. And uh, before you do anything else, also please give us a follow. If you haven't been following Alexander Botez's channel, nobody needs to follow my channel, let's be honest. Everybody should follow your channel. Every, no, but seriously, everyone should follow your Uncle channel. Uh, yeah. she, she's officially one of the uh, the biggest channels in the chess category on Twitch, if you didn't know that. And she's got a lot of fans and followers already. So go ahead and give give that uh, follow extension a click. Head over to twitch.tv slash Alexander Botez and uh, do that before we go. Are, are we ready to hand this thing off? Yeah, we are. I, I, think, I think we are. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for doing this commentary with me. I had way too well, much fun at these games. You'll have you'll have Robert back next week. Don't worry. That's true. That's this true. Year. So but... all will be right again in the world. But uh, <laughs> signing off from Studio C, Alexander, have a great day there, and uh, stick around, everybody, for Grandmaster Robert Hess and Alexander and. Nope, and oh, Amon oh, Hamilton. Me. That's me, but yeah, good. Cover, covering <laughs> the uh, the Central Division. Till next week. See you then. All right. See you guys.